Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our workshop this morning, Gardening for Birds, Butterflies, Pollinators, and More, brought to you by the WaterWise Community Center, which is part of the Chino Basin Water Conservation District. We will be getting started in... Good morning, everybody. Oh, Welcome. I am so sorry about that. Hold on one moment, please. Ha, huh. let's try that again. I'm recording this on YouTube right now, and apparently I forgot to close the window in the background and start an audio loop. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our workshop for those of you who have just joined us. Today, we're gonna be spending the morning talking about gardening for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and more focused primarily on Southern California because that's where we are. However, many of the principles that we're going to talk about are going to apply uh, wherever you are. They're kind of universal principles of gardening for wildlife and the images as well as some of towards the end the specific bird species and plants that we'll talk about uh, as we get further on in the workshop are going to be focused on Southern California. And most of that will apply throughout much of the rest of the state as well. Uh, so good morning. Just a quick note before we get started, there's a couple of links on the screen here. You can download the slides of this presentation, especially later on, there's some reference lists, uh, related to plants, related to, if you're in Southern California, the common backyard birds and butterflies and stuff that might show up if you want to be able to identify them if you are doing this kind of gardening. And so you might want to download the slides. You can do so if you go to cbwcd.org slash presentations, the first link here on the screen, that'll take you to just a download link list of all of the workshops that we teach online. And so if you find this one, the easiest thing to do is to do like right click and save linked file as, and it'll be one big PDF file where each of the slides is its own page. And I'm gonna type that into the chat right now in case someone needs to refer back to it later, cbwcd.org slash presentations. And this workshop is also being recorded. And so as soon as this is done, you will be able to rewatch it at cbwcd.org slash YouTube. Uh, the actual recording of this one, you would go back out into uh, our main profile and it'll be the most recent uh, upload, but there is a tighter edited version of a past presentation that you can get on that workshop playlist if you go to that right away. Uh, the content is almost identical and that's cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And that's also a place where you can check out a lot of our other workshops. So if you want to get more into the aspects of just general design for California native gardens or installing and establishing a native garden, lots of other details that can support this workshop as well. And so with that, let's proceed. With next slide. So my name is Scott Kleinrock. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager here at the WaterWise Community Center. And for those of you joining us for the first time, just briefly tell you a little bit about our agency and what we do. We are a very small public agency. Technically, we are a special district, so similar in some ways to a school district or a fire district. And we exist to protect and replenish and conserve water on basically the western edge of San Bernardino County, serving the communities of Upland, Rancho Cucamonga, Montclair, Chino, Chino Hills, Fontana, and Ontario. And we say our mission is threefold. Our bread and butter has long been percolation. We own and operate a series of holes in the ground, most of which are literally huge old gravel pits, which have been re-engineered to capture stormwater, which would otherwise leave our communities, and through natural processes, clean that water and have it replenish our local water supply, which is very significant in our area, provides a, an average year over 50% of the water supply, very rare for Southern California. However, a while ago, our board of directors also realized that if water is being used not wisely and our area is 
mostly uh, urban suburban, a lot of water goes to lawns. And if, if the sprinklers are just going and running in the middle of the night and watering spaces that aren't used, that all of that work to capture that water it isn't really optimized. And so we also do lots of engagement with our local community around water conservation and largely in the form of focusing on the outdoor landscape. We have a beautiful demonstration garden at our headquarters in Montclair that's open for free six days a week, every day except Sunday and major holidays. You can come check us out and you can find out much more about that on our website. And we do lots of education for all sorts of different groups from curriculum integrated K through 12 education to workshops both in person in our demonstration garden, as well as online, as well as professional training, internships and more. And so who am I and why am I talking to you about this today? Well, my name is Scott Kleinrock. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager here. And this is what I do. Uh, most of the slides you'll see today are going to be pictures from my front yard uh, and backyard. And my partner, Kira, who's a professional horticulturist, as well as myself, uh, native gardening, kind of focused on uh, providing habitat in urban areas is what we're most passionate about. I also, not a purist, I love growing my own food. I have fruit trees, we have vegetable beds, uh, but native gardening focused on providing for the awesome critters that are around and need good homes and providing more habitat for them is, is really uh, a large part of what we've been doing for quite a while. And my background uh, is in horticulture, as well as landscape design. I have a degree in landscape architecture and have worked at a variety of different scales and commercial projects, uh, worked in the public gardens world for a number of years. But what I'm really most passionate about is what we can do with the typical urban and suburban landscapes that are all around us. And if you use your lawn, then I'm not telling you to be a good person. You need to take it out if you still have a lawn. Uh, but I ask people to think about how much of it do they really use? And maybe you can do something that requires less inputs and provide so much more for you uh, with the areas that you don't use or don't want to uh, spend as much resources maintaining. And one of my favorite things that we can do with our spaces, if we're lucky enough to have a little space that we can decide what's going to happen there, is plant some beautiful, primarily native plants, which will provide color, which will provide amazing smells and a great place to be, uh, but will also provide so much more for the environment around us. So that's a lot of what today's class is going to be about. And so Last thing before we jump into it is I'm going to launch a very quick opening poll just for questions where you can tell me a little bit about yourself. This helps us get metrics, which allows us to report on our programs and be able to continue to offer these to the community. So please take just a moment to click through the answers and then we will jump into it. I see some people have started to complete the poll. Thank you very much. For those of you joining us from other areas, everybody is very welcome. And I always love seeing where everyone joins us from. If you could please type into the chat function where you're joining us from, that would be great. It's always interesting to see who's here. Give it just another minute or so. Someone's saying the chat is disabled. Oh, other people are typing in. Welcome, everybody. Oh, other people have, okay, I'll take just a moment to try to figure out what's going on with the chat. Multiple people have chat disabled. Yep, 
very strange. Some people are able to Huh. Okay, well, we are going to get started. And for those of you who are, I guess everybody is having problems with the chat, uh, we'll just have to use the Q&A today. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. But for the most part in this workshop, we, uh, yeah, everybody's chat seems to be disabled. Uh, that's no problem. But for the most part in this workshop, we actually don't use the chat. We use the, oh, let me see if I can do, oh, it's a new feature from, I guess they changed the version. Now I got it. Okay, chat should be, be disabled. Uh, and this is a perfect time to talk about what we should use the chat for and what we should use the Q&A for. Thank you, everybody. Uh, you should be able to chat now. Uh, thank you very much for letting me know that there is something going on with that. Uh, welcome, everybody no matter where you are joining us from. So as we proceed, uh, questions are encouraged. And I'll tell you a little bit about how to use the chat and how to use the Q&A for our purposes. So because there's a large group today, uh, we don't have people like raise their hand and call on them because there's a lot of downtime, with the audio, and stuff like that. And so if you have a question, please type that into the Q&A function. That's the one with two little text bubbles. You can hit that and go in there from your uh, Zoom interface. That's because on the back end, on the second monitor that I'm looking at, that keeps all of the actual questions uh, very well organized. And I can make sure that I don't miss anything. In the chat, feel free to uh, use, com uh, use that for comments or anything like that. I always check all of the chat comments after I am done teaching. But when questions go into the chat, uh, oftentimes I miss those in between other things. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. And then what I'm going to do is kind of proceed with uh, going through a section of the presentation. And then in between sections, I will stop and answer questions that have come in. And uh, what I do is in between sections, the questions that I'll answer are ones that are going to be interesting to the general audience pertain to what we've been discussing. If you have more personal questions related to like, would this be a good plant for the conditions in my backyard? I always try to answer as many of those as I can, but sometimes I need to hold those till the end of the workshop. And then we can go until afternoon if we need to. So with that, let's proceed. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. First, why even bother gardening for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and other critters? Then we'll talk about some big philosophical gardening ideas. How is habitat gardening or ecological gardening maybe different than the traditional kind of gardening that we think about? Uh, the preview is that it's much more fun and it's easier to be successful. Uh, we'll, we'll take a quick look about you know, what, what might this look like with some examples from Southern California. Your area might be different if you're joining us from somewhere else. And then we'll break down some of the key elements related to habitat gardening, no matter where you are. These are those important universal elements, water, landscape structure, and plants in your landscape. We'll look at some design inspiration, some top habitat gardening vignettes for Southern California. And then we will look at, for those of you in California, some of the most common birds, bees, butterflies, and then interesting habitat plants that you might want to use in your backyard. And so with that, let's proceed. And we'll proceed by telling you a little bit about my morning this morning. I love teaching this class because every morning I go out into my backyard that morning with my camera and I teach this class usually a couple of times a year, sometimes in the summer, sometimes in the fall, sometimes in the winter. And there is always something to see. That's one of the first most exciting things about gardening for wildlife is that there is always something different going on at different times of the year. So first thing I saw when I stepped out my back door into my yard was a goldfinch meticulously picking apart all of the seeds on this white sage 
uh, dried flower stalk where the seeds have ripened. And that's one of the really cool things for those of you in California or summer dry areas about habitat gardening. You can work with your plant selections, even if you're growing all native plants, to always have something in bloom. So you can see in the background, I have a desert willow tree, which is a, a native from the California desert, and that's in full bloom this time of year. But a lot of our local native plants from like the chaparral, the dry hills, are glorious in the spring, but then their adaptation to the dry season is that they kind of dry out. They go either dormant or semi-dormant, in the middle of the summer. And it's been a hot, dry summer. And I don't water this white sage really at all. Sometimes it gets a little bit of water, like when I water the desert willow every once in a while, maybe every three weeks or so, or a couple of pots on the patio nearby, uh, but really pretty dry. So the plant itself is pretty dormant, but that doesn't mean there's nothing going on because then it is activated for months and months in the summer with these beautiful goldfinches that are picking apart every single seed. And so even though the plant slows down, the garden does not. And then right from there, I looked up and saw one of our resident hummingbirds landing on the uh, power line coming down that provides power to my house. And you can see it was up early snacking on something. We have some native primroses that have tons and tons of this heavy pollen right now and attract tons of beneficial insects. But those insects are also food for the birds. And so a lot of uh, hummingbirds diet, they drink nectar, but they also need protein from little gnats and other insects. And so I think it got a little bit of pollen on its beak because it was up early snacking on the insects that were on uh, the flowers of that heavily evening blooming uh, ochre's primrose. So it all kind of comes together in a cycle in the yard and it's, it's really cool to see. And it's always also a source of learning and mystery. So for example, we have all of these, they just come up from seed every year, uh, annual sunflowers that they're so tough, we don't even water them. They come up in areas without irrigation. And not only are there lots of bird seed, but they're great, great for many insects. And there's some sort of uh, caterpillar that seems to make its cocoon and underneath a folded down sunflower leaf. And my partner and I have both tried to look up in books and on online references and see what it is. We still can't figure it out, but it's definitely there. So there's always something more to learn. It's always something fascinating. And it doesn't matter if you know the name or not in the end, if you embrace the principles of gardening for habitat and ecosystem kind of based gardening, you're going to have all sorts of stuff going on. That's just going to be really interesting, uh, no matter whether or not you're motivated to look up the names or things or not. I personally like to try to learn that because then I, I'm able to kind of remember patterns and what happened this year, last year, uh, but it doesn't really matter. And then there's always all sorts of insects and butterflies, moths, tiny little pollinators, uh, around in the garden. There was a lot of tiny little things that I, I couldn't even get my, my camera to focus on in time. But here's just an example of one little moth that uh, was kind of an overcast morning. So some of the heat loving pollinators uh, were getting up a little bit later and I wasn't able to take pictures, although I know they'll be around later. And some of the evening guys were, were still uh, around. And so it's a very interesting little moth. But in addition to just uh, being cool to see the moth itself, uh, moths, butterflies, and especially their caterpillars are super important bird food. So it's again, that whole system that's building. Uh, praying mantises usually emerge in my yard uh, midsummer. And this is actually the first kind of adult size praying mantis that I have seen this season. So that was very cool to see on this very showy buckwheat flower. Buckwheats are some of the native plants in California that are really showy summer and fall. So to kind of balance that summer dormancy, uh, the sages are really doing their thing in the spring and then have provided seeds for the birds now. And the buckwheats are really in full flower right now in my yard. And so just notice this praying mantis hanging out uh, early in the morning on this flower. Absolutely beautiful. That color is so interesting. And so here's a couple of pictures from the backyard. So again, this is from the other side, but this is a different sage, kind of in its dormant stage. I've watered this once this summer. 
uh, but it's perfectly adapted to that now that it's established. And you can see that colorful desert willow in the background. Desert plants tend to stay more active in the summer as well, so kind of balancing all of that out. So this is still providing lots and lots of nectar for hummingbirds. They fight over these flowers, and this is providing seeds for the birds that eat seeds. Here are some of the buckwheats still in flower. Have morning doves throughout much of the year in the yard, big, beautiful, unintelligent birds hanging out right now on the wire. They come around for seeds. And so this time of year, there are so many of them in the yard. Sometimes I feel bad because I startle them every time I leave. And then what's checking out our native narrowleaf milkweeds. Uh, some of you might have heard that monarch butterflies were officially uh, label as endangered this week, which in some ways is very sad, but hopefully that will also bring increased recognition. And there are things that we can do to help monarch butterflies in our yard. One of them is plant whatever kind of milkweed is native to your area. So in Southern California, that's not the brightly colored tropical milkweed. Uh, there's a few different milkweeds. The easiest one to grow is called narrow leaf milkweed. It's gorgeous in bloom a little bit earlier in the year. Now it's kind of slowing down some. Uh, and it's not the most attractive plant year round. It's gorgeous when it's in bloom. I have it towards the bottom of my yard where it gets a little bit of water from my fruit trees. But here is a habitat in action. I didn't see any caterpillars uh, this morning, but sometimes they're quite well hidden. Uh, but people with milkweed often ask me, what do I do about all these little yellow aphids that are on my milkweed? Uh, I've never seen them actually cause a decline in the milkweed, but they're always going to be there. You never want to resort to pesticides. One of the best things you can do to help butterfly populations is don't use any pesticides in your yard. Oftentimes, even the organic pesticides uh, not only will negatively affect your target insect, but a lot of them are bad for caterpillars. So uh, stay away from that. But this is habitat in itself. It's not going to hurt the plant. And aphids are the favorite food for ladybugs. And so lots of ladybugs in the yard, which then will also eat aphids off of my vegetables, different species of aphids. Uh, we don't get those yellow ones, those specialized on milkweed, uh, but other aphids or scale or other just common vegetable garden pests, the butter, uh, the uh, ladybugs are going to be there for that. And then just looking up, I'm lucky enough to have a young but getting sizable uh, oak tree. And that's just a constant, constant source of uh, habitat for all sorts of different things. Lots of different uh, caterpillar and butterfly species, which in turn are the most important food for baby birds. And oftentimes I'll have like maybe six different species of birds in the tree at the same time. This morning was all about the goldfinches, probably had 20 or 30 goldfinches in the yard picking through the seeds. And then whenever I was a little bit too noisy and, and startled them, fly back into the oak tree. But then there's that big structure and then they're ready to fly back out and go about their day. And I was wondering if I was going to run into another longtime resident, which is a mockingbird who's in my yard every day. And uh, there he was towards the end of my time taking my walk. And here's a picture from a slightly kind of more moist meadow area where we do water a little bit more. This is right outside of our back door. So just close to the patio for a sense of lushness and for habitat, we have a recirculating water feature and a area that gets just a little bit more irrigation, resident hummingbird. And even though this is kind of a, a long rambling uh, informal tour of my yard, what I'm trying to do here is kind of pepper in some of the ideas and motivations and some of the concepts related to uh, then the more structured workshop that we will jump into in just a moment. So I also want to share with you some other highlights from this week. Uh, native bees. Native bees are really, really important pollinators. Uh, they are more effective pollinators than honeybees, and they don't sting, and they are suffering from habitat loss. Uh, they need our help much more than the honeybees. And native bees are very diverse, but uh, this is an example of a group of male longhorn bees, which uh, the male bees kind of have it easy. Uh, they don't even form nests or burrows, the, the native bees. Uh, they just kind of hang out. And so last week they were enjoying hanging out in some of our annual sunflowers and you'd wake up in the morning and they were still kind of sleeping, just sort of waking up 
as it's starting to get warm. And so you can get real close to them and check them out when they're moving slowly. Look at all that pollen that's accumulated on this little guy. So interesting. And then water, we'll talk more about water, but some source of water is just critical. And uh, the birds have really been enjoying, this is one of my latest DIY projects that I did in my yard. Uh, I was kind of trying something new. So I just took the largest rock that happened to be in my yard and I used a, uh, a drill that's normally kind of meant for concrete. You can rent them from any place that rents tools. I just took a maybe less than five minutes to just drill a hole straight through it. That was a five eighths inch drill bit. And then I ran a tube up to it to a little fountain pump. It's this little uh, vault made for water features, plastic thing that get dug, got dug into the soil. And I do this all as DIY stuff when I have time. So I put this in, I've been working on this garden for four years and we decided to try that. And I haven't finished covering it with rock because I still have to get a hold of more rocks and wash them off, but it's, it's a process. But the birds have really been enjoying that. Uh, birds love water, need a clean source of water, but if you can find a way for it to be moving and circulating, and it can just be as simple as like, this is just a ceramic dish that would go underneath a pot uh, and can just be as simple as having that. And there's little wobbly things that you can buy online that kind of keep the, the, the water moving in the bird bath. Doesn't need to be this ornate unless you want to get into it. And it brings all sorts of stuff around. So this is an Oriole stopping by migratory. They don't normally stay for long in my yard and doing its thing. And this is all in the city. So this yard is in uh, urban Pomona, uh, suburban you know, backyard. And it really is, if you build it, they will come. Uh, so last week, and birds got quiet for a little bit. And there's a hawk, you know, seeing if it can find a snack, because hawks need to eat too. And oftentimes, they will sometimes go for small birds or lizards, lots of lizards in the yard. They were all asleep this morning because it was still kind of chilly. And, you know, it might feel like it's the city. It might feel like it is uh, lifeless, especially if you have a dried up, crusty uh, former lawn right now, which a lot of people do. But nature is everywhere, including in the city. And if you embrace these principles of gardening, just about anywhere, it is amazing how fast things will show up. And that's, you know, all throughout the year, even in the winter when it's chilly, the bird baths is frozen over, even in uh, Los Angeles area, it happens. Uh, there's going to be uh, some characters that are around year round and then different birds that come and go depending on the season. So in February, we have warblers, which we don't have this time of year. Uh, Black Phoebe, we have year round and we get other things like white crowned sparrows. So there's always something coming, oftentimes something going, and it keeps the garden super interesting. It's not just about you know what's in bloom. That's a very one-dimensional way to look at a garden. And certainly, I like beautiful blooms. Uh, that's not what this class is necessarily about. But you can have that, and you can have this whole other dimension going on at the same time. So why garden for wildlife habitat? Well, it's something that we can do. To me, that is such a huge part of it. it can seem very overwhelming these days because it is very overwhelming to read the news about uh, the state of the environment, what's going on with uh, decline of species, what's going on with climate change or other environmental issues. And some of them are big things where it's kind of hard to think, how can I really make a difference? If you have a spot where you can put some plants native to your area in, whether it's in the ground, in a community space, at a school as a volunteer or where you work, or a few pots on a balcony, it is something you can do. And not only that, but it's something that you can see some pretty close to instant results sometimes. And if not instant, you know, within a year, you will start to see this transformation of who's around and who is taking shelter in your yard taking place. It's pretty amazing and it feels great. And it really is something lovely when you get out of bed in the morning, especially for me on the days where I just don't want to do much uh, to see all of this happening in a yard or in a space every single day. Douglas Talame is one of the most prolific. He's a researcher uh, 
as well as a writer uh, on the kind of national scale. He's written a number of great books talking about uh, what we can do in our gardens to support wildlife. And I love this quote of his. It's becoming increasingly clear that much of our wildlife will not be able to survive unless food, shelter, and nest sites can be found in suburban habitats because the suburbs cover lots and lots of this country. But it's not that difficult to provide that. And in fact, if you look at the amount of maintenance, energy, materials, costs it takes over the course of a year, it's easier to provide that than to maintain a typical suburban landscape. Habitats in decline, and we can provide it. And then for us, it's not necessarily just about altruism, but it gets us in touch with the wider world in a way that feels great. I mean, there's no substitution for getting out into your local wild area and going hiking, like for where I am in the Inland Empire, getting up into the local San Gabriel, San Bernardino mountains. But I can't do that every day. But by having this sort of landscape in your yard or in your community space that you are involved with, that provides some sense of that on a daily basis. And it's not the same. Wildlands are extremely important, but we can provide so many of the benefits, both for certain species, especially birds and butterflies and pollinators within our urban and suburban or uh, built rural landscapes. And it's so educational, whether it's for you or your kids or your grandkids, there's just stuff going on all throughout the year, and it really can get us in touch with the wider world in a way that a typical landscape cannot. And it's therapeutic, quite literally. You know, this has been studied, whether it is the rates of how people heal from hospitals when they have a view into a, quote, natural uh, landscape, or whether it is studying people's stress levels when they are able to interact with a naturalistic landscape, it has been proven that interacting or even just seeing kind of a natural or semi-wild sort of landscape is beneficial uh, for both physical and mental health. And it also gives your cat something interesting to look at. And when it comes to just the gardening aspect of this, all of this together actually creates a garden that you want to spend time in, which makes garden care more enjoyable and kind of magically easier. I actually, most of the year, as long as it's not triple digits, look forward to the time that I spend in my yard caring for it. These landscapes can be lower maintenance for sure than typical you know, turf and roses landscape. Every landscape requires some maintenance. Every landscape requires weeding and care. But with these landscapes, you put stuff in and then you really get so much out of it, both for yourself and for the wild world. And the experience of doing this is, is nice, quiet work. I'll do some of my landscape care, you know, just hand pruners and a cup of coffee nearby. And it's not being stuck behind a lawnmower, kicking out disgusting fumes and all noisy and all sorts of stuff. I'm enjoying the songs of the birds as I'm out kind of pulling some weeds. Uh, most of the plants are low water. In Southern California, most of these landscapes, if you're working with well-adapted native plants, are going to be very happy with water, deep watering once every uh, three to four weeks once established and are going to be relatively low maintenance. And the cool thing is that most of that maintenance or most of that care is gonna happen either in the spring or in the fall. Most of these plants only need to be touched uh, once or twice a year. And those are the really nice times to be out. And in the summer, it, it's quite a bit quieter and some weeding, some kind of touching up here or there, but it, you can mostly just kind of enjoy your garden in the morning and in the evening. And uh, yeah, that's all really nice. So for those of you also thinking about the water, uh, if, if you are thinking about, you know, how much total water will these landscapes use? They're going to require uh, about a deep watering once a week up front for the first year. But then after that, when it tapers off, that's about the same amount of monthly water that uh, the areas where people are down to watering just 
there if you have a lawn once a week uh just a few minutes a week like once a week eight minutes a week kind of schedules these landscapes you're going to water once a month and you're going to water more and most water agencies are going to be perfectly happy to work with you on that but the total amount of water that they will take still falls within the total amount of allotted water even within our our most stringent regional water restrictions that's kind of the sweet spot for how much water these landscapes are going to want anyways so that's pretty cool and so we can do something that's good for the planet that makes your property a more beautiful enjoyable space that saves a ton of water and resources versus a conventional landscape uh, that almost seems like a no-brainer and so the proposal is, is not that everyone needs to do this over their whole property but the proposal is that maybe this sort of landscape can be the new default landscape for Southern California or the appropriate version for your area, wherever you are, and that you are empowered to help make it happen, whether it's at home, whether it's in a community space, whether it's the small parking lot landscape at a business that you own or work at. There's a way to be involved uh, anywhere, whether it's you getting involved in volunteering in a, in a local uh, native or habitat garden. And then if we want to do other things, like you do need a lawn because, you know, your daughter's learning to play soccer, uh, then for the appropriate amount of space, you know, maybe that will be okay if there's enough water. At this point, there's not enough water to really keep most lawns uh, healthy and happy. So maybe that should just be at park spaces. Or if you are passionate about growing some of your vegetables or a couple of fruit trees, then go ahead and do that. But for our broad areas, uh, beautiful, very low water gardens that provide all of this habitat are a great place to start. And so I guess I got ahead of myself. That's kind of <laughs> this slide is it doesn't need to be all or nothing. You don't need to start from scratch. You don't need to level and take every plant out of your backyard and go from there. You can start at a bit at a time and add plants and other elements over time if that's best for you. That's often how I do projects, you know, a little bit at a time when I have the time. Uh, you don't need to get too caught up on design. We'll we'll talk about things, but basically learn what plants are going to be best for you. We'll talk about resources for that. Put the right plant in the right place. Leave yourself some space to walk around or, you know, enjoy a meal outside if you want. And then, you know, put some some trees, some shrubs and some smaller plants in and, and kind of learn as you go and go from there. If you want to get super into design, then you can. And we have lots of workshops that talk about design. You can check out our California Native Garden Design Workshop. For those of you in our local area, I'll be teaching that live at the Waterwise Community Center upcoming in September. But if that seems like a lot of pressure for you, don't worry about it. If you put in a few trees, uh, some nice shrubs and some nice smaller plants that are well-researched, they're going to be good for your area, good for the birds and butterflies. Uh, then you're going to have a more lovely garden than the vast majority of people do, and it will have so many benefits. So how doable is this really? Uh, it truly is. If you build it, they will come. So all those pictures you saw from my backyard in 2018, you know, this is what that yard was, had been neglected for a very, very, very long time. Uh, but that big trash backyard was why we bought this fixer upper of a place, because this is really our hobby and what we like to do. And if you don't want to have it be, you know, your main hobby, that's fine. Uh, you can still have a great selection. You know, you won't have 200 different species of plants, but, you know, 12, 15 different plant species that are well selected uh, in your backyard and, you know, small yard, just fine. Uh, it doesn't, you don't need to go over the top. It doesn't need to be your, the main kind of source of purpose in your life. If you have to put some plants in, you can research them and just choose some nice native plants that are gonna be great for birds and butterflies and, and that could be it as well. That's just as good. And so why is this important and, and how does this sort of work out? And, and why is it if you build it, they will come? How do things just kind of magically show up? Well, that could be a very big question in its own workshop, but here's how I like to think about it and, and our role in the process. If you are in Southern California, especially if you're in the greater Los Angeles area going into the Inland Empire, there's a chance that your neighborhood might look something like this from an aerial photo. This is my agency service area. This is kind of where I live. And we have the San Gabriel Mountains to the north. And then to the south, before you get to the real coastal area, 
uh, there's a, a hilly area. And that's, you know, this is pretty much how San Gabriel Valley is, is set up, pretty much how San Fernando Valley is set up. And then if you're on the other side, uh, you know, there's going to be the coastal area. And then to the north of you, there'll be uh, some hills or maybe Santa Monica Mountains and then taller mountains farther north. And our communities are what has spread everywhere in between in all of the flatlands and up until the foothills. And so these are very important wild areas that are just critical reservoirs for biodiversity and wild animal populations. But they need to get back and forth, some of the species. And what is in between can also be very important, especially because like in this area out farther off of here, there's still chaparral areas that are becoming suburbs. Uh, and so we need to provide in our communities. And we can do that. And an important thing is that for some of the species that need to go back and forth between these wider areas, or some species that might go on longer migrations. And so there's butterfly migrations every year, some bigger years, some smaller years that come from out in the desert and will come this way through our neighborhoods. Those butterflies need spots to stop and get nectar and other things like that, other things like that uh, as they go along. So what we can do in our yards are provide nodes of habitat, little individual way stations where some things will live in your yard year round. Some will come and go seasonally. Uh, we have certain bird species that spend the summers up in the mountains and will spend the winters in our backyard. And then for those that are on a migration, like the butterflies, they will stop and spend uh, an hour or sometimes a couple of days getting nectar off of your plants and then continue along their way. And so in terms of, you know, what I've seen around, just for example, in my neighborhood is uh, at the Waterwise Community Center, we have a great collection of native plants that are great for wildlife. And my house is somewhere over here. And there's not a lot of other houses, you know, in between with native gardens, at least so that I've seen. And so every one of, you know, any person in, in this neighborhood that adds another little node of that connectivity, that's going to be really, really helpful. And that will all have an additive effect. And so it starts with one space and that makes a difference. But then if this starts to spread throughout the community or spread throughout your region, that all has, you know, an additional additive effect and we can all kind of take off together from there. And so as we transition away from that kind of larger idea, let's kind of zoom in a little bit to a bit of the philosophy about what you might be doing in your yard. And if you are interested in gardening for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and more, how might you think about your garden space in a way that's different from how gardening has been in this country, in major media, uh, has been written about or has been framed, or those pictures, you know, glossy pictures in garden magazines where a professional photographer takes this picture that looks like an impossibly colorful garden. And I can tell you, because I've spent a long time studying gardens, traveling to gardens, every single garden has plants that are dying and plants that aren't making it. But those magazines just take their pictures in the peak time of year. And it's it's known in some of those gardens, you know, second or third week in April is going to be the best week of the year. And professional photographer comes when the lighting is perfect and they just don't take a picture of the dead plant. They frame it out. And, and sometimes people look at those and think, if I'm going to be successful with the garden, that's what my yard is supposed to look like year round. And that is just absolutely not the case. Uh, no garden looks like that year round, including those gardens in the glossy magazines. Oftentimes those gardens will have, you know, extra work and professionals that will come and prep the garden right before those photos are taken. And, uh, and that's just not what it's supposed to be about. You, if you do this style of kind of ecological or habitat gardening, you will have moments of staggering beauty, chances are. And, and it's it's might be on a, a pretty regular basis. But don't put your that pressure on yourself to have that quote perfect looking garden year round. 
And in fact, all the tidying and stuff like that, that that comes with trying to achieve that sort of look is actually not what's best for a habitat garden. So here's my take on conventional gardening. Conventional gardening is only concerned with what the garden looks like, just that visual sense, which is only one of the many senses that we can use to enjoy a garden. It's conventional gardening. The garden is basically an outdoor decoration. And ideally plants are like sculptures. They have a look and they look that way for as much of the year as possible. And a lot of energy, time, often expense is spent on trying to manipulate the space to keep it as close to this like one singular vision of peak bloom as possible. And if there's any change or any disturbance to that, that's most often seen as a frustration. And then the people who are attending to that garden work very hard to just eliminate those disturbances and get back to the original idea. And so in pursuit of that, accidentally, I've talked to plenty of people who got out the pesticides and sprayed off the leaves because there was something eating the leaves. Well, those are caterpillars often. And those caterpillars will turn into beautiful butterflies, or those caterpillars happen to be the single most important food source for the vast majority of species of baby birds who need tons and tons of protein, even if they're seed eaters when they're adults, and that comes in the form of insects, and oftentimes most ideally caterpillars. And so conventional gardening is really quick to kind of go to war with anything that's at odds with this very singular vision, which is often, you know, more color at all costs. And not only is that not that fun, but it's very stressful and it's harder to be successful than taking an ecological approach to gardening. With an ecological approach to gardening, every yard or garden is a living ecosystem. And we get to enjoy and in our yards observe and learn about complex webs of relationships that exist between plants, animals, including insects, and if you wanna get really into it, the, the microorganisms in the soil, the fungi and bacteria and nematodes. And most of those are usually things that help us out. We don't need to fully understand it all, but if mushrooms are coming up in your garden, well, there are some species of mushrooms that are pathogens. The vast majority of them are either going to be beneficial or just breaking down like the mulch or the decomposing leaves or organic matter and eventually cycling that into something that helps nourish the soil and improve the conditions around it for this complex web of life. And so although an ecological garden can also have lots of color, Part of the whole goal and the experience and even the kind of aesthetic is really embracing that web of relationships and being able to value that. And that's something that's going on in the middle of summer, even when plants are dormant. And it really kind of cues you into finding this whole other sort of beauty, which is much deeper than just looking at the flower colors. We are primarily a steward in these gardens rather than a controlling hand. We are up in the mix and we are nudging and pushing the whole space in a direction which is going to achieve more. We're creating interventions, we're seeing how things respond, we're observing and then we're taking it from there. It's not about forcing this thing to have this one singular vision at all costs. And when you do that, unexpected and delightful things happen pretty consistently. And oftentimes on the aesthetic end, you end up with a more beautiful garden than you can ever plan. Once some of your perennial plants and wildflowers that because you've researched and you know they're really well adapted to your area, kind of take hold, they'll spread, not necessarily becoming weedy, but kind of create their own patterns in the garden where they come up and you'll start to have this kind of combined blend of what you were planting in the garden and then these kind of very natural elements that you can never have planned. And the, the even the visual aspects of that often become very beautiful. And sometimes things get a little too dense or you have to thin. And it's not like you never prune or you never pull out a plant or you never do anything, uh, but it's about kind of enjoying this informal learning experience of being part of what's happening. If there's a setback, if something dies, it's not about 
get a new version of that plant, a new plant of it and slam it back into the ground. It's a moment to think about, hmm, was that the right plant for the space? Uh, maybe I'll try something else. If it wasn't the right plant for the space, don't beat up on yourself. Just think, huh, maybe it, it was hotter. There was more reflected heat and maybe I need to you know, try something that could really take that. You do a little bit of research. Uh, you, you learn something new and interesting and you go from there. And that's just not only going to be a beautiful space, but there is kind of a magic to these ecological gardens that that just even in the most beautiful conventional gardens that I've seen, uh, there's just a whole other level of what's going on. And it's more fun, more interesting, and much easier to be successful when you look at it through this framework of curiosity, rather than you have to control every aspect. And so when you take that ecological gardening framework and you also bring in the whole wildlife aspect, it does this all while you intentionally provide food, cover, and water for the critters in your yard and neighborhood. And that helps provide those permanent homes for certain species, as well as the connectivity and corridors for many species. And so what might that look like? Well, here in Southern California, that could look like a few things. Uh, the gardens that are going to do this the best are going to be a little bit more on the wild looking side. Now, certainly if you choose native species and you just know that for yourself to be happy, you need something that's a little bit more clipped and conventional looking. I've seen great gardens that do that as well. With all that clipping and pruning and stuff like that, uh, you won't have quite as much of the habitat benefit, but it's still gonna be night and day uh, better compared to like a traditional turf and roses sort of landscape. And so uh, here is an example from a front yard garden in Pasadena that I saw on the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour, which is a great garden tour weekend that Theodore Payne Foundation, which is a nonprofit dedicated to native plants and the promotion and conservation of native plants hosts every year. Definitely check it out if you are in Southern California. And so this is a medium-sized front yard in Pasadena. This was designed by the homeowner and uh, was the first garden that he did. And you can see here a number of different species, but it's it's not a whole botanical garden's worth. Uh, this is in the spring. These buckwheats this time of year you know, will be in bloom while the coastal sunflower will have seeded. It will be more dormant, but I'm sure that there's birds picking through all of these sunflowers, birds picking through all the white sage seeds. And... Uh, yeah, beautiful naturalistic space. Also, just structurally having, we'll talk more about structure later, but structurally having uh, small trees, taller shrubs, lower shrubs. This house feels a lot more set back from the street and a lot more like its own kind of semi-private oasis than if it was just a flat line of turf all the way up to the street. But even then along the street, there was all sorts of flowers and other things. So it's not like it's turning its back to the neighborhood. There's a lot more for the neighbors, for pedestrians to look at as well. Here is the same backyard that I showed you. It's my backyard uh, with the pictures at the beginning. This is it at less than a year old. And so that desert willow tree planted from a one gallon plant, always plant the smallest size plant, one gallon, uh, usually is going to be the smallest size plant to plant. Occasionally you can plant four inch plants if you find them, but normally plant from one gallon. And sometimes you can find trees that small as well. Uh, they'll grow faster, they'll be healthier, and they are a lot less expensive. And, and so you can see these were all planted from tiny plants. And even at a year, they're starting to grow in and all of the wildlife was starting to show up. And then as that structure builds in where you have trees and shrubs and small perennials, it just builds and builds on itself. And so this is some fall pictures from my backyard, uh, I think a couple of falls ago. And yeah, lots of color year round if you want. Uh, but tan and browns of dried seeds are also colors. And especially once you kind of tune into that subtlety, you get a lot more out of the aesthetic as well. The rust colors that sometimes you get, those are all beautiful, beautiful colors. They're just not blue and purple and you know pink, uh, but are just as beautiful. Here's a small little meadow area that's part of what happens to the rainwater that falls on my property. And so this is a little grassy area that's very green in the spring, fall, and winter. And we only water this every 
maybe two or three weeks now that it's in partial shade from this mule fat shrub. And so we let it go a little bit dormant in the summer, but it's still a great shady place to ha have a chair and, and spend some time. And like I mentioned earlier, hours and hours of entertainment for the cats. And so this is my front yard. I use this as a case study in our California native garden design class. And so if you're interested in seeing more about this, lots and lots of other pictures and explanation of the design process in that class, which you can join us for or check out the YouTube recording. Uh, but this was the front yard right after getting planted. So it's not gonna look like much when you put it into the ground. But if you've researched what, where the plants wanna go, sun, right, sun, shade, how big they're gonna get so you can space them appropriately. Don't just go get a bunch more plants and slam them in, give it a few moments. And so this is March, 2019. This is five months later, Habitat in Action. We had a resident hummingbird move in and for weeks and weeks, this dried stalk of this California fescue, I'd see her there every single morning waiting and then hunting and then chasing other hummingbirds off her nectar source. Um, just one example. So this is that same landscape at about six months in, things really start to get going. If this is going to be the first kind of wild front yard in your neighborhood, sometimes signage is an interesting thing to add. In my case, this is definitely the first wild style front yard in the neighborhood. And so we got our yard certified as a wildlife habitat, which is a cool program through the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, it's a self-certification thing you go through, you kind of check off some checklists. And if your garden has food, water, cover, and places to raise young, which is basically related to cover, having some shrubbery, a couple of trees or something like that, then with a small donation to the National Wildlife Federation. I think when I did it, it was 20 something dollars. They will send you this cool metal outdoor sign and you could put it up, letting the neighbors know what's going on here, that this is something that is very intentional and done for a good reason. In addition, you know, in the spring, there's tons and tons of color and, and it looks like a beautiful garden, but especially if you let things go kind of dormant in the summer, this will let people know what's going on, but it's all gonna be happening whether or not you do the sign, or you can make your own sign, uh, totally up to you. And so about six months, this is you know just about a year. So the large shrubs are gonna be trained as small trees, I still have a lot of growing to do, but the ground plane has pretty much grown in. And different things throughout the year. So sometimes there's lots of color, sometimes it's visually more form and texture, but always something for the wildlife as well. Here is another front yard that I drove by the other day. Uh, people weren't home, unfortunately. I wanted to ask them about their yard. This was the only yard in that neighborhood that I saw in the front yard. And a vast majority California native front yard garden filled with habitat this is in Rancho Cucamonga. And just absolutely beautiful. Uh, this was, sorry, I can't remember what time of year it was. Looking at the buckwheats, this was probably, uh, and the fuchsia, this was probably uh, maybe late winter. And yeah, absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Very naturalistic, nice place to sit and enjoy it all. Here is a front yard that I helped or design in uh, Ontario. And you can see combining different elements, a uh, nice, beautiful tree. This is a Desert Museum Palo Verde, great tree for pollinators, but also kind of provides a little bit more privacy to the house, a mix of native again, uh, native tree, sages and buckwheats. For those of you in California, that's kind of the backbone. You're mixing in deer grass, some California fuchsia, and then a dry stream bed to capture and hold on to the water when it rains. Well, that's just a uh, kind of glimpse of what it can look like. Yours can look very different, especially if you like a more modern style. You can have you know angular pathways and do what you want with the plants. It doesn't need to look like any one thing. It doesn't need to have that rustic look if you're into something else. And again, check out our native garden design workshop for lots of other kind of visual styles. But now we're going to focus on kind of those key elements, those universal elements of habitat gardening. First one is water. Water is so important. And that reminds me, my mouth is getting a little bit dry. I'm gonna 
take a sip of water right now. All life needs water. And in our urban and suburban areas, a clean, reliable source of water can be quite hard to find. And it's also very entertaining and hilarious to watch birds bathe and splash around and see who comes. This is a cast concrete bird bath that someone that we know wasn't using and gave us before we even got any plants in the ground in our backyard because we had this right before we moved. We set that up and just changed the water daily and scrubbed it out with a scrub brush a couple of times a week. Best practice would be at least a couple of times a week uh, just to keep everything clean because birds have no decency. They'll poop in their own water. If you concentrate uh, populations of birds in one place, like at feeders or bird baths, keeping things clean is very important because that prevents uh, disease transmission. And so for bird baths, just tilt out the water, put new water in every day. So locate your bird bath somewhere close and convenient to a hose. And then at least a couple of times a week, it's good to uh, spray it out and scrub it out with a scrub brush. Uh, the best thing to do for spraying it out is to get a uh, like a chemical or cleaner spray bottle, empty one from the hardware store. And you can do, it's about a 10% bleach solution. So about 10% uh, bleach, you can just eyeball it, but about 10% bleach, fill the rest with water. And that is a high enough concentration that'll kill disease organisms, uh, but not you know over the top kind of concentration. You know, scrub it out, tilt it out and fill it with water again. That'll keep everything nice and clean. And so we put this out started doing that in the backyard before there were even any native plants in the ground. And it is amazing what sort of bird life showed up. And they very quickly learned the patterns and they learned this is a reliable place to come and drink water every day or to come and bathe every day or every couple of days. And you know that alone will really kick things into gear. And then when you get the plants in, that's going to take it to the next level. And you know, it doesn't need to be big or fancy. We have a whole number of these ceramic dishes in our backyard. That's the vast majority of our, our bird bathing sorts of things. And, and they tend to like the ceramic dishes even more than this, you know, what would be obviously more expensive concrete bird bath. This one's a little bit deeper. So sometimes some of the larger birds, this is a California tohi. Uh, like this, but especially the small finches, they they really, really like, and the sparrows really, really like these ceramic dishes. If you can get one uh, that's kind of a glazed ceramic, that's going to be even easier to clean, but these terracotta ones just need a little bit more elbow grease when they're getting scrubbed out, but they've worked very well for us as well. And that's just, you know, what we had, uh, and these are less expensive, and so that's what we went with, and they've done very well for us. If you want something that's like a fancier overflowing water feature, you know, you can definitely do that. Uh, this is my parents' backyard, which is in Van Nuys. Uh, and the smaller birds will not really use this, but they get hawks and falcons in the middle of, you know, suburban uh, San Fernando Valley that stop by for a drink out of this one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, different sizes is great, but it doesn't need to be fancy or expensive at all. So here's some key principles. Keep it clean, make it easy for yourself by keeping it close to the hose. Change out the bird bath water daily. You'll also never have to worry about mosquitoes. Uh, mosquitoes take at least 72 hours to kind of get through their life cycle of being a little larva up to being an adult that can fly. And so if you, and when you tilt out the water, the, the larvae are fragile. If you tilt out the water and refill it, on a daily basis, that birdbath feature will never be causing mosquitoes. If you go out of town, uh, just leave it uh, empty in the time that you're out of town rather than uh, risk the vectors. Scrub them out regularly. Saucers are great, but oftentimes you might not want them directly on the ground. And this is critical if you know you have a lot of stray cats in your yard or in your neighborhood. Uh, those bird baths or the saucers directly on the ground can make the birds a little bit more vulnerable to cats. Now, that being said, if that's not really that much of an issue in your yard, then you might have them at a variety of different heights. And so we learned, uh, one, we don't make our yard that uh, 
habitable for cats, which, which is sort of because cats are just, it's not their fault. I love cats. Uh, we have four rescue cats, but they live indoors all the time because cats are very aggressive hunters of birds, whether or not they're hungry, it's just instinctual. And it's just uh, not fair if you have a cat and you're doing this sort of gardening, keep them inside. Uh, one of my cats, we used to sometimes let go outside supervised on the leash and that kept him out of trouble. Uh, but as he's gotten older, he is not interested in that anymore, which is good because we've more and more gone towards habitat gardening. If cats are not an issue in your yard, uh, Sometimes lower bird baths are nice because some of the birds that normally dwell on the ground and eat seeds, like doves and California towhees, uh, will prefer a bath that's more on the ground because that's just where they tend to live. Uh, a variety of sizes and depths is ideal if you have the space and the will to maintain more than one. Even if they're close to each other, a variety of sizes and depths will be great for different birds. And then going beyond birds, uh, depending on conditions, where you are, saucers with, especially like a saucer with gravel and some coarse sand or maybe some stone that you keep some moisture in is ideal for butterflies and other puddling insects that need water but aren't going to land like in open water. Uh, that can be great. And, and that's a little bit more trying, kind of hit and miss seeing what's going on, making sure that that there's not going to be enough open water in that because it's harder to clean every day, that you're going to have mosquitoes, a little bit more advanced. And then it just depends. So I, for example, in my yard, uh, kind of messed around with that for a while, but the butterflies, just because we have uh, fruit trees that, that get irrigated, uh, they tend to just like our normal kind of sandy loamy soil and they'll do all their puddling and get their moisture from there so i just got rid of that eventually because it was just one thing that the wildlife didn't really need because the garden was providing it for them anyways so here is another example from a garden that i saw on the theodore Payne foundation tour in a front yard you know, perfect example and a lot of the uh bird baths that we have in our yard are similar to this where it's just a, a log to elevate it some surrounded in the garden. And here you can see there's a rock in case there's any small bird that felt more comfortable landing on the rock and going from there. You can kind of improvise just what you have, whatever sorts of props that you need. I will say that this ended up uh, not being a great design because uh, a squirrel jumped from above and landed on the edge and flipped over uh, and uh, broke but uh, so basically any sort of wide base is great so this could work if I had a couple other little blocks of wood to kind of support it a little bit better but kind of improvise go from there and, and learn but the most important thing is some source of regular fresh water is really critical to best supporting uh, wildlife in your yard especially the birds and then if you can and it's going to be within reach of a hose and where you can maintain it you know put it somewhere where you can get a good glimpse of it from inside your house in a room that you are often in and can see out the window because certain birds are bold and will come around when you are around. So for example, in our yard, the goldfinches, they might get scared when I open the back door and walk out, but they'll come right back. But there's other birds that are much more timid and especially the migratory birds who, you know, might not be around for long enough to learn the patterns and learn that you're kind of safe to be around. You're going to see them much more and have much better bird watching from inside your house when you're looking out from inside the house. Bird baths are best close to a small tree or a dense shrub. Doesn't need to be right there, but uh, someplace where if the birds get spooked, they feel comfortable fleeing to. Uh, don't put them in a place where plants can where cats can easily hide and pick them off. Like I mentioned before, it's estimated that two to 4 million birds are killed by cats every single day in the United States. It's not the cat's fault, uh, but it is on us then to be as responsible as we can while we are creating this habitat for the birds. So in addition to bird baths, it's also ideal to provide a source of moving or recirculating water. Uh, this could be, as simple as a pump submerged in a container or overflowing into a pre-made vault, like I showed earlier. Uh, if mosquitoes are an issue, if it's a large enough container, 
and there's some plant life in it as well. You can use mosquito fish who will eat a combination of insects and algae. And oftentimes with some mosquito fish, which are often available for free from your local vector control district, uh, they will they love mosquito larvae so much that'll just stop that problem right there. There is also a product you can buy called Dunks that are a, uh, it's basically a natural bacterial derived product that interrupts the life cycle of mosquito larvae and does not allow them to mature into adults. That is one of the only in certain cases, uh, quote, pesticide products, even though it's a natural pesticide that I will use. That same product, uh, I would never spray on my garden because it actually can be deleterious for caterpillars. Uh, but because you are taking this product, which is kind of a cake, and you are putting it directly into the water, uh, you're not going to have caterpillars in that water. So there's going to be no contact. And that's how you can continue to provide that source of water for the birds that would be really important uh, without having a mosquito and vector sort of issue. So this before things grew in quite a bit more in the backyard is another water feature that we have. Now there's so many plants around it, it's kind of uh, hard to see, but it is still there doing its thing. And this is a galvanized trough uh, that you can get at certain hardware stores around here. Tractor Supply Company is the name of a, a chain that sells lots and lots of different sizes and shapes of these things. Uh, it's meant to hold water, so it's waterproof. So just filled with water, a cheap like $35 fountain pump that's just attached to a plastic irrigation riser. There's just a cord that's going out the back of this over the top. You don't need to get fancy and drill things in and try to seal it back up unless you really want to, because oftentimes those are going to be the areas that are going to be likely to leak. So here it's just over the back, connected to a heavy duty outdoor extension cord and a little thing that you could buy online that's a kind of waterproof uh, plastic thing that clasps over it so that where the pump plugs into the extension cord, that becomes waterproof as well. And then we just have some milk crates in the base of this holding up a few native aquatic plants and sometimes running water, if there's enough movement, is enough to prevent mosquitoes. Uh, in this case, just for this example, just that little pump overflowing uh, creates moving water in terms of attracting the birds. It keeps this oxygenated enough that the fish that now live in there are just fine with that. The water doesn't become stagnant. However, when we first set this up, we were hoping that you know we wouldn't need fish and that the, the running water would, uh, would work. Wasn't enough water movement, especially with the little corners near the plants to prevent mosquitoes. So we noticed there was some mosquitoes in it. First thing we did to nip that problem in the bud was we got some of those dunks. And then as soon as we got some mosquito fish for free from the local vector control district, uh, we put those in here and we've been mosquito free in this trough ever since. And we don't even have to feed the mosquito fish, just the combination of plants, the little bit of algae that's in here, and then whatever uh, insects do land and they eat has kept a sustainable population in here for many, many years with no food or additional care at all. Every once in a while, that algae kind of clogs up the pump some, pump needs to be cleaned out, but pretty low maintenance overall. And the larger birds like larger water. So that larger water features will help attract things like hawks to the yard. Here's another picture of this in the first garden in a backyard of a place that we rented. Uh, that was here in this yard. Uh, every once in a while, there'd be a raccoon that would come around and raccoons like to clean off stuff that they eat. And so it would knock some stuff around. And so for that, we just took a, a branch of a pomegranate that was kind of spiky that we had pruned and kind of laid it there just to kind of deter the raccoon from causing too much ruckus. And it worked pretty well, but was still, you know, didn't deter the birds at all. In our current yard, that has not been an issue. And here you can see the cord just coming out the back. Something Thing, you know, you'll notice it, but once you have this in a garden, no one else looking at your garden is going to notice the cord as something that they're looking at. It can be smaller or self-contained. It's another yard that I saw on the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour, uh, where it's all contained in this one pot. And so that's water. I don't see any questions that have come in. I've 
member, if you have questions, you feel free to type them into the Q&A, but we will kind of keep going because there's plenty to cover. Grab another sip of water really quickly. Moving on from water, kind of previewed this concept, but we're gonna get into it a little bit more. Key elements are landscape structure. So think multiple different tiers of vegetation, trees, shrubs, and ground cover. I cannot emphasize enough the value of trees in your landscape, especially if you are in a hot and dry climate like Southern California, both for the wildlife and for the humans. Trees are shade and shade is outdoor comfort much of the year. Trees are also where birds will sleep, go for the heat of go in the heat of day. Uh, sometimes shrubs, but trees just are really a whole other level. Birds are most active in the morning, in the late afternoon and evening in our area. They need somewhere to go in between. Trees are the best place to go. Uh, trees also just in terms of the volume of what they create, whether it's uh, for example, here you can see this young desert museum Palo Verde, uh, which is incredible early spring blooming uh, pollinator plant, especially for our like, bumblebees and carpenter bees. And you know, just the volume of flowers on a mature Palo Verde tree is, is a huge source. Or this young western redbud over here, which has also great spring blooms, and then those blooms mature into seed pods that the birds will eat and get just the volume from this large shrub, which can be kind of pruned up into a small tree, which is what we will slowly be doing here. And so those are in this example are going to be the top layer. And then in the mid layer, you can't even see it here yet. Uh, there's a, a buckwheat shrub, island buckwheat. There is a, a desert shrub, desert mallow. There's bush monkey flower, and then there's all of these annual wildflowers. So here, this area is dominated by Clarkia, which is one of the easiest annual wildflowers to just sprinkle some seeds out of the mulch. And the birds really, really relish eating every single one of those little seeds that they can after those dry out. And so when the wildflowers dry out, if you're not in a uh, high fire danger area, you can leave them for quite a while and let the birds do their thing without actually you know, providing any bird seed. Uh, bird feeders are kind of a mixed bag. Uh, there are ways to do it responsibly, but I'm not generally in favor of bird feeders because they, uh, they provide for generally few species of birds and they concentrate so many birds in such a small area that they become places where disease can easily spread. And they're much harder to properly clean than a bird bath. And so I like to grow my bird seed and working with annual wildflowers like Clarkia and California poppies are a cool way to do that as well as uh, lupins. But Clarkia is just one of the easiest ones, can take part shade all the way to full sun. And they're kind of tall and beautiful. And so you can see the birds landing on them and eating out all the little seeds. And then kind of a lower layer as well. So multiple different layers. Your version of different layers might look differently or it might look different, but the idea of trees, shrubs, ground covers. Uh, don't be afraid of planting trees. They're not going to destroy your house. Uh, don't put them right on pathways. Don't put them right next to your foundation, but uh, do plant trees. And they don't need to be huge trees that are going to cost a lot to maintain. They can be small trees or large shrubs that you prune as trees. Here's kind of another example in the front yard uh, of this young toyon, which will grow into be the tree. And then Deer grass, which is a beautiful native bunch grass, which actually provides uh, seeds that uh, small finches really love. Buckwheats, smaller buckwheat, red buckwheat, that goes right along the path. California fuchsia, different levels of vegetation. And I think we'll talk about it later when we get into plants, but also, you know, a time to mention. Uh, nectar and seeds throughout the year. So here, red buckwheat is done blooming in seed. This is going to be in the fall. And California fuchsia is really coming into full bloom, doing its thing, providing very important source of nectar for hummingbirds. 
And then kind of mixing up within those layers of vegetation, other things as well. So edging with the uh, branches, mixed sizes of wood chip. These all add to the habitat. Lots of different native bee species will actually nest in old branches and galleries and old branches. Also beetles will spend time in there as well. Beetles become important bird food. And that whole cycle goes on and on. People do ask, you know, if you have branches or logs or whatever, which are so important for habitat, a uh, couple of questions. What about wildfire? If you live in the urban wildland interface or in a high wildfire danger area, don't just skip that. Don't have that near your house. You have to be responsible on multiple levels, and that's just fine. I am in the middle of an urban suburban area. That's less of a concern, and I can do that. People also ask about termites, you know, and, and it depends. You'll know your area. Uh, I have never had an issue with termites when I have branches and logs and things like that around the garden. If you know you just had to have your house fumigated or there's termites and it's a huge problem in your neighborhood, again, maybe you skip that part of it. For me, uh, I'm not sure if it's because there's so many birds and other things that would eat the termites, there's just a balance or if it just hasn't been an issue, uh, but I've not had that be an issue for me, nor have locally in kind of our inland Southern California area have really heard that as being an issue uh, with other habitat gardeners. And it could be as simple as, yeah, there's, there's just enough of a balance where maybe if you had a bunch of uh, woody debris and you only had turf, you know, maybe that would be more of an issue. Uh, talk about hummingbird feeders more later. And I did mention, want to mention here uh, spider webs. So not being too neat in the garden. So this is just an example of, this is a little wreath you can see here that my partner Kira made from pruning our native grapevine. And spiders like to live in it and make webs. And that's kind of cool to leave because hummingbird nests have a significant content of spider web. That's actually kind of the elastic like lining that hummingbirds harvest and use to kind of hold their web together. And that allows their nest to be very small and hug the eggs when it is just created. And as the birds grow, it kind of stretches around. And so we will see hummingbirds harvesting spider webs uh, to build their nests. And if we were very quick, quick to clean that all up and have it be all super neat, then those hummingbirds wouldn't have that easy access to that material that they need right nearby, and we would not get to see them doing that. Cover. So vegetation provides cover. So uh, sometimes I talk to people who want everything in the garden to be very, very low, like nothing above shin high. And if you work with lots of perennial plants, then you can do that. Uh, that's going to be a lot of work because it's going to be a ton, a ton, a ton of small plants. And for most people, get tr some trees, uh, some medium-sized shrubs, and then just around the edges, some smaller perennial plants is going to be what's more sustainable in terms of maintenance. But those medium or larger plants, including things like big rambling grapevines, if you have the room, are going to provide cover. So this was a summer where I saw this California tohi spending lots and lots of time in this grapevine, and it would run out and do its thing and then go back to it kind of throughout the season. Places to perch are important as well. So branches are very important for birds, uh, but birds also like to be able to perch in more open areas and be able to look around, whether it's this California tohi that's just kind of observing things. This guy spends most of his time on the ground eating seeds, but will perch and take a look around. This was just a fence pole concrete footing that I tore out of the ground. And after cutting the fence away, rather than throwing it in the trash can, which is very heavy, I flipped it upside down as just a object in the garden. And the birds like to perch on it and look around. And especially for the birds that hunt. Uh, so Black Phoebe is a very common suburban bird. And they are aerial hunters. They eat insects. You can see this Black Phoebe that caught something there. It's not quite enough in focus to see what. Probably a little moth or something like that. And is about to enjoy its meal or maybe bring it back to the nest. 
And so in order to get the best perspective, they need places to purchase well. And because in our built landscapes, our urban suburban areas, we don't leave lots of dead standing bushes or trees, which would naturally occur, for example, like in a wooded area, we might want to provide some of those. And so providing perches, and the easiest thing to do generally is to find a nice shape of an old branch if you had some trees pruned or if someone was having, you know, neighbor was having work done on their yard and having some trees pruned and there's some decent sized branches or even sticks or, you know, pieces of metal, whatever, uh, but something and, you know, dig it, dig a hole, pack it into the ground, make sure it's nice and stable, but things like that provide great perches. And so this is a perch that's outside the window of where we have our desk in one of the rooms in our house. And so often we'll see birds, especially Phoebe, perching on it and then swooping down to get something and then coming back. Uh, so get to see a lot by strategically choosing where we put that and then providing that extra element where being able to you know, perch on the edge of this young coffee berry shrub is not quite the same in terms of the view and being able to launch itself into the garden. If you are not in a fire danger area, uh, woody debris, so leaf litter, branches, logs, small brush piles, extremely good habitat. So on the left here, this was a wood pile for habitat, not for burning. And you can see all of these openings in the edge of the, the log. Many of these are going to be galleries for native bees that build their nests in woody debris. And so these days you can buy online or you see uh, plans online, if you've looked into this at all, about making uh, these wooden uh, structures for native bees or buying some of them. Sometimes there's bamboo in them. Sometimes there's paper tubes. And if you really want to be able to like check on them or do it as an educational thing, like those are all right. But those are no better than something like this, which is just naturally where they would form their nests out in the wild world. And so you can have smaller versions of it as you go. And you can artistically, if you want, kind of work that into your yard. It doesn't need to be a big pile. We just happen to have lots of wood after needing to have some hazardous neglected trees taken down. And so we had room for both, but that can be kind of mixed in here or there just as well and not concentrated in one place. And that'll work out for you. Diverse coverings on the ground helps as well. In some areas, you might want to have, you know, a traditional mulch when, when your garden is getting going, especially before the shrubs have kind of grown in and started shading themselves. It's useful to have, you don't need to go crazy for a California native garden, uh, just an inch or two of mulch that helps keep the soil temperatures down a little bit in our installation and establishment of native and water wise gardens class. We talk about that a lot more. Uh, we actually have a whole class on mulch and compost for water wise gardens that talks about it a lot more. And it can be useful, but for a habitat garden, you don't want just wall to wall thick layer of wood chips, uh, mixing in some gravels, some stones, some small boulders, and also some bare soil for ground nesting pollinators. Lots of native pollinators uh, make their nests or repurpose old nests from other burrowing insects in the ground. And if your whole landscape is smothered in a thick layer of wood chip mulch, they won't be able to use your landscape for that purpose. And especially with the rocks, creates all sorts of little different niches in your garden. Uh, lizards really will spend lots of time in and amongst the rocks as well. Uh, and it just kind of, again, has that amplifying effect. Uh, and it does it need to be done in any particular way? You know, this is an example from part of our yard and you don't need to do it all at once. So for example, for our backyard, uh, we had a lot on our hands just getting the backyard cleaned out and ready for planting. And so after an area was done planting, it was pretty much, we didn't go overboard, but just a couple of inches of wood chip mulch to also help prevent uh, the huge weed seed bank that had been left by that yard being neglected for many years from coming back up and the plants. And then over time, as we got little bits of woody stuff or in planting in our yard, it's pretty gravelly. As every time we planted something, uh, some 
bits of rock or gravel came up and we put them in buckets and then eventually started putting them back out into the yard to have that varying effect. And you know, here, this is a very kind of informal area of the yard and to provide a little bit of uh, kind of emphasizing the area we decided was pathway, just kind of laid that out. And that diversity has a nice effect on the habitat. Here are some of those dried clarkias that we left in our yard. So again, this is not kind of formal, traditional garden magazine aesthetics, but all of the life that comes to pick through this to us is a really important part of the beauty and experience of our gardens. And even down to the wood chip mulch, if you can get wood chip mulch that has different types of uh, woody stuff, so especially a few larger chunks of wood, that kind of brings that more naturalistic benefit, uh, kind of almost more mimicking uh, natural, what would be there in, in a natural kind of woodland or transition out of a woodland area. Here's just an example of the importance of bare patches of soil and then dry bare patches of soil important as well. You don't want this to be somewhere where you're going to be watering you know, three times a week because that will obviously flood the little nest gallery of this native bee. And then as you go, things start to kind of grow in. So for example, this rocky gravelly area in the north facing part of my front yard uh, today is largely covered by this wild strawberry, which hardly ever gets irrigated, but it's kind of on the north shady side of the yard. And that's fine too, kind of things kind of transition. And if you really wanted to, could cut this back, but habitat is in effect. Uh, even at the micro scale, even though it's covered by the plant material, there is that diversity in ground cover and it's still very much doing its thing. And together, all this provides diverse food sources, shelter niches, and nesting materials for birds and insects, which are food for other birds, lizards, and other insects. And as an added bonus, this is also gonna help with pest insects as well. So lizards are voracious insect eaters. That's gonna help provide a sense of balance. And they're also hilarious to watch. There's probably over 50 Western fence lizards that live in various spots of our backyard, and especially during mating season when they're posturing and doing push-ups and the males are showing off are just endless sources of entertainment. And so focusing in on the plant selection a little bit, plants can be chosen to provide seeds, fruits, leaves, or flowers with nectar and or pollen. And these are gonna support diverse birds, native bees, butterflies, and other more interesting critters. And the best plants for this, in my opinion, can pretty easily be selected to be perfectly adapted to our soils and our sites so that they're going to require no fertilizers and no pesticides and little irrigation water. And so we'll end with a top plants discussion. We'll see how far into that we get, but if you wanna download the file, that will be there for you as a resource. And where what that plant is, is going to be based on where you are. So for example, the top plants I discuss are for most of Southern California. Uh, some of them work well in the desert regions, but if you're in the true desert, then the plants for us that grow in kind of our inland chaparral areas local to us, a few of those are going to work out in the desert. Some of them won't. So it's also about tapping into any local knowledge or local resources and then leveraging kind of this discussion of all of those concepts and tying that together. And so if you're in California, most areas of California are covered by a chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And most of those chapters of the California Native Plant Society have regular either talks, uh, a lot of times those are online and recorded and available afterwards, or meetings. And most of the time, uh, even if you aren't able to afford to you know, financially join the chapter and pay dues, everybody's welcome at the talks and meetings, and uh, they're always looking for more people to be involved. And so that's an easy way to learn. You can also look at different lists that are going to be available, and we will look at some of them. And so when you select well for your area, then that's what, what you will find. You know, your area is going to be different than my area. Uh, redwood trees are technically California native plants, but not what I would recommend for most people in Southern California, where if you're up in the North Coast, maybe that's appropriate. 
And so thinking a little bit about planning your nature sanctuary. When you think about plants, do you want to focus on putting the right plant in the right place? And that's not rocket science, just requires a little bit of research and learning your potential plants. And there are great online search resources to help you with that. And so right plant in the right place, the most important factor is how much sun the area gets. Is it full sun, which is doesn't need to be full blasting sun all day, all day. Full sun is defined as six or more hours of direct sunlight hitting the area throughout most of the year. So in Southern California, or in most places, you know, something could be directly on the east side of the house and get morning sun for a lot of the day, but shade in the afternoon or on the west side of the house and be shaded in the early morning, but still noon to afternoon sun and still be considered full sun or part shade, which is maybe a few hours of direct sunlight and then shade the rest of the day or high dappled shade, or it just might need shade all day. Uh, the water needs for the plant. How often are you going to irrigate it? Is it something truly you know, local native? You might be watering once every three or four weeks or even less in the summer. Is it a medium water use plant? You know, there's a couple areas, small areas in my yard where we have plants that even though they're native, they like a little bit more water. And so for those, we put them down near our fruit trees and they thrive down there where they get access to that extra water. So grouping plants with like water needs. So you're not trying to you know, keep one thing dry and then the plant next to it needs to be watered, you know, every week. Uh, that's an important thing to be successful. Sometimes you might hear the term hydrozoning, which is just a fancy word of putting the plants that want the same amount frequency of water next to each other. How big is the plant going to get? This is one that's super important for uh, especially first time gardeners. When you look up the size that your native plants are going to get, if you see five to six feet, that plant for, so for example, uh, native sages, they grow fast. Uh, you might see five to six, five to seven feet. If you're in hot inland Southern California, that sage is going to be seven feet and it'll probably be that in a couple of years. So if you get that and think, well, it's small and uh, you, you like that plant. And so you put it two feet off the edge of a path because that's where you have room to do it. That's going to be a mess. That's going to be an impossible maintenance and pruning situation. Research the size of the plants, and then you might need to make some tough decisions in what plants you actually have room for. But if you do that aspect of doing the right plant, right place, and you give the plant the room it needs to grow, then it's going to be happier, healthier, and it's going to look better because you're not going to have to be hacking back at it all the time. Uh, you might be pruning it once a year, but you want to give it the amount of room it needs. If right after planting, there's just too much space in between, then in between plants, but not right at the base in the fall or the next fall, you can sprinkle some annual wildflower seeds, some poppies and clarkias or something, and that can fill some space in between, but give the plants the space they need. And then soil drainage. Uh, a lot of California native plants like what's called well-drained soil. And if you have a sandy or a loamy or gravelly soil, that's going to generally work pretty well. If you have heavy clay or very compact soil, that doesn't drain. And so sometimes even, for example, in our local area, uh, there are some soils that naturally would be great soil, but then they have recently built kind of typical modern suburbs there where they bring in just incredibly large equipment to flatten the whole area and grade it. And the soil is just so compact by the time that the houses are built and sold and it never gets loosened up. That, that soil, even though it's not clay in terms of drainage, performs like heavy clay. If that's the case and your soil doesn't drain that well, that's all right. You're just going to want to work with plants that are adapted to clay soils. And you might go a little bit farther to uh, make sure you plant your plants a little bit high or maybe even build some raised areas. That's about as much as we're going to have time to get into this on this particular class. But on our other classes where you can check out the YouTube recordings or join us as we kind of go through the whole series of planning and learning how to build out a garden that we will be teaching throughout the late summer and into the fall as we get to peak planting season in the, in the mid to late fall time. Uh, check out our installation and establishment for native gardens class and are choosing, purchasing, and planting native and water-wise plants class. And we get way more into both the right plant, right place, and what to do if you don't have that perfect soil drainage. So just remember, 
important, right plant, right place, do a little bit of research. And we will look at those online sources where you can enter in the different factors of your site to find the right plants for your place. If you're starting with a small area, you're just going to choose one area to kind of dip your toes in and explore this new kind of gardening. A sunny area will generally be more effective for habitat gardening. There's lots of great things you can do in the shade. And if that's all you have, don't be deterred. Uh, but just in terms of the number of plants you'll have to select from, the areas especially that tend to uh, attract pollinators, maximizing the flower and seed production, you're gonna be a little bit more flexible in sunnier areas. For maximum impact, aim to have a diversity of species in bloom and in fruit for as much of the year as possible, but also keep it maintainable. So those might sound like kind of opposing factors. So let's explore that just a little bit. If you are in California, cool thing is that you can have stuff in bloom in your garden year round. And then following those blooms, that means you know seed production on a lot of those plants, plants immediately following that. And so that's part of the right plant, right place and research is you can research and make sure you have some blooms in the spring, uh, blooms in the fall, uh, blooms in the winter even. Our manzanitas are really good winter blooming plants. And I mentioned the really important combination of sages and buckwheats. That kind of keeps you covered as well. Most of the sages are gonna bloom spring to early summer, followed by seed. Most of the buckwheats are gonna bloom summer to fall, sometimes even farther, seed production following that. So that's a really important combination with maybe a couple of manzanitas for the winter for hummingbirds and pollinators and butterflies. But if you are not someone who's like, I'm going to be a gardener as my hobby, you just want a nice garden that kind of gives back to the earth and contributes, that's fine. But don't put a hundred different species in, don't do one of this and one of that and one of this and one of that. For the average person who I work with and I might design just a nice yard, again, like I talked about one or two small trees, some shrubs, some perennials, I find that 12 to 15, maybe 20 different species of plants total is about what will work for a average size suburban front or backyard uh, without going over the top. And in fact, and part of that is not having too many different plants to, not having too many different plants to have to learn about, what needs to be done to them. Part of it is if people are trying to have a little bit more of a composed look, I just saw a question come in that was about dealing with an HOA, which we can explore. If you want it to have a, a little bit of a reference to a more traditional landscape look, having repetition, having uh, some of your shrubs, maybe uh, your key medium-sized shrub repeats three times instead of three different shrubs. Having some of your ground covers be planted in not just one of this and one of that, but maybe threes or groups of fives. That's actually good from a habitat standpoint as well, because then when that butterfly or that bird flies into that area to get its nectar or get its seeds, it's actually able to have more resources all in one place. And that becomes a very important habitat patch. So if that's more gonna be what works for you, uh, then that could be more maintainable and it could still have great habitat benefits. Don't put one each of a hundred different species usually. If you are an amateur botanist and that's part of what appeals to you, then you can have a great habitat garden and do that. But for most people, start with 12, 15, maybe up to 20, and it can be less. You can have a great garden with five different plants. And if they're great native plants, you know, one or two species of sage, one or two species of buckwheat, uh, a tree and uh, a couple of penstemons uh, can be an incredible habitat garden, very easy to maintain and can have a nice composed look. So let's check out Dee's question, which just came in before moving on. Uh, can I plant over only evergreens? Dealing with an HOA, they aren't open to dormant areas. Starting with a small area, eight to 10 foot estimate. Yeah, absolutely. So, and there's there's different aspects of dormancy, uh, but there are plenty of great evergreen you know, native plants that don't quote look native. Uh, so for example, at the edge of my front yard, I wanted a hedge between uh, my house and the neighbor's house. And we are working for a nice evergreen backdrop uh, with 
California coffee berry, and there's dwarf ones that make a great formal, almost looking foundation planting, California coffee berry and holly leaf cherry. Most people would never suspect that those are native plants and they're both incredible habitat plants. Uh, the native buckwheats are quite evergreen, especially if they get that water every three or four weeks. And even the sages with a little bit more water, uh, a lot of them won't really uh, go native. So, ab or go, not go native, won't really go dormant. So absolutely. Uh, but yeah, there, there are great evergreen uh, options. And, and even some of the native perennials, uh, like the buckwheats and the penstemons with a little bit more regular water, like every two weeks instead of every month, uh, those are going to go much less dormant and can be much more HOA friendly. So it absolutely can be done. That's going to be part of your right plant, right place. For you, the right right place means something that uh, won't get uh, HOA board members hackles up and you can absolutely make it happen. And so here we go. It doesn't need to look wild if that does not appeal to you those large masses of well-chosen plants. So here is a much more conventional looking front yard, which is probably 85% native species, some Mediterranean species as well, uh, which, with a much more formal look from the Theodore Payne, Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour, uh, designed and installed by a company called Formelly Landscaping. And so this is native yarrow. This is full of beautiful white flowers in the spring. So this gets a little bit more water but stays very lush. Here's sage brushes and sages, which are with water and clipping going to have much less of that wild look. Now this is not going to have quite as much habitat value as a more wild garden with all those different materials and left to go to seed and do its thing if it's kind of clipped like this year round. But certainly compared to conventional landscape, this has so much more value to the larger world. So for more design, design tips, especially if you're thinking about HOAs or things like that, definitely check out our California Native Plant Garden Design Workshop or join us uh, in September when I teach that here at the WaterWise Community Center in Montclair and combine that with what you're learning today. So flowers year round. It's gonna be easy to find spring flowering stuff into early summer. For those of you in Southern California who are not in the true desert areas, one trick to extend the midsummer, like right now, hot dog days of summer bloom season, is to integrate some plants from the true desert areas. The true desert areas tend to get some thumber, summer thunder showers, and some of them are kind of riparian species, even though they are very adapted to hot, dry climates. And so things like desert willow and desert mallow and chuparosa uh, will really keep those blooms going through the summer when our local native chaparral plants, uh, their adaptation is to kind of go a little bit more dormant. And then when you get to the fall, uh, get the buckwheats, or if you have room to really let some plants that are beautiful plants but can kind of spread aggressively go, uh, asters and goldenrods are great. Uh, coyote brush as well is a calm green shrub for much of the year but in fall has blooms that are really, really loved by native pollinators followed by seed that is important for birds. And the coyote brush also makes a great, this one is kind of thinned out. Uh, and this is the beautiful garden at the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. Uh, but as a dense shrub, just have a, a very dense branch pattern that is great for birds to shelter and nest in. And so in addition to those right, plant selections, we also want to talk about garden care. Because like I just said, you can keep everything clipped and stuff, but you're going to be clipping out a lot of your habitat value. One of the most important things that people who grew up with, quote, you know, traditional, traditional kind of 1950s American horticulture as written about in garden magazines and kind of Sunset Magazine back in the day and stuff like that. You know, you, you've been trained, you've been brainwashed into deadheading, deadheading, especially people who grew up with roses. As soon as those flowers fade, you cut them off to push more flowers. And some of the native plants will respond in the same way by pushing more flowers when you deadhead them, but the seed is valuable as well for this whole cycle we've been talking about. So don't deadhead faded flowers too quickly. Let seeds develop. And then when you cut your plants back, 
leave as much of the trimmings in the garden as possible on the ground as new mulch if you can, if that works for, again, fire danger, HOA concerns. Maybe this is something you do in your backyard and not your front yard. You're going to figure out what works for your style and your goals. Uh, but there's a typo here. It's supposed to say both seeds and twigs will be used. So for example, let's talk about just uh, as an example, native sages, uh, many different species of native sages. Uh, if you really want to extend the bloom season, right when their first blooms fade, you can deadhead and maybe get another set of blooms. I tend to be more hands-off and lower maintenance, so I, I don't deadhead my sages. I just let them, uh, I trim them back once a year in the late fall uh, before they're going to be basically setting up the new growth that's going to become the spring flowers. Uh, so with my native sages, I let them grow. I let the seeds form. Right now, you saw the pictures in the front yard, or sorry, in the backyard from this morning of the goldfinches loving all those seeds from the white sage. They're poking through the other native sages as well. And then in the fall, when I do finally cut them back, and I will once a year, uh, I will, with as many as I have room for, I won't just cut those dried out seed heads and put them in the green bin. I'll either stand there with my pruners and just kind of, it's called chop and drop, just kind of keep cutting them down a little bit. And so instead of bringing in more wood chip one day to uh, then add to the mulch, I'm just breaking up those, those seed heads and that material is just becoming part of the natural mulch. Not only does it look naturalistic, but those seeds are then going to continue to support the birds that spend time on the ground, the tohis, the morning doves that eat their seeds off the ground and will never climb up into the bushes. Uh, bushes or shrubs with hollow stems. And so sages have hollow stems as well as their flower stalks are hollow. Leaving some of those in the yard, even if you're clipping and cutting them, leaving a few of the longer ones here and there, those stems are really important for many native pollinators forming their nests. And so that's the natural version of those little tubes that you might have seen in the, the pollinator kind of hotels or whatever that you could buy. Those are just mimicking you know, what you would have when you were naturally kind of letting that stuff stay in the garden. So don't be too neat. So this you know, this is not going to be going in any sort of magazine, this young red bud. And because there was that a lot of open space around the base when we first planted it, uh, we had some Clarkias. But this is a mini habitat powerhouse of what's going on. And then eventually when those Clarkias came out, uh, they just got kind of shredded up and laid down as almost like a wildflower straw in an area that was more open than that as part of the mulch layer and kind of continuing that whole cycle. If you your shrubs are starting to mature uh, and you're generating more green waste material. So right now, like I have a pretty large backyard and a high planting density because we do this. As much as possible, I'll chop and drop some of the material. And in addition to that, I will pile up some of the material and I have a small inexpensive electric tripper, chipper shredder. It's not a big gas guzzling thing. Uh, it's not going to suck my arm and it's very safe. And it only does branches up to about an inch. But for all of the dried out shrubby material that it would just be too much dry material to leave all over the place, it kind of grounds that down, crimps it, and it turns into something that does form that very naturalistic mulch. And I'm not covering or drowning my plants in a big thick layer of it. And in fact, these days I have so much plant material that I'm finding spaces to put it. But I know that there is so much habitat value in leaving that stuff in my yard and not sending it out to a green waste dump between the seeds and the nesting material in it and all of that. And I'm still putting some stuff in the green bin, especially during my big fall cleanup because I just generate so much of it. But uh keeping as much as I can on site to keep that cycle going is really part of it. Your maintenance practices are maybe not quite as important as your plant selection, but really not far behind your plant selection as well. And again, with maintenance, uh, no pesticides is super important because it is so easy, even with the organic pesticides, to uh, 
cause harm to the beneficial insects, the butterflies, the pollinators that you are trying to support. And so just some ideas. If you're interested in more about, you know, what kind of shredder or things like that, check out our mulching compost for Waterwise and Native Gardens workshop. And there, we go into more information about all of that. And so you can see here, goldfinches eating those Clarkia wildflower seeds, lots and lots of entertainment. And goldfinches are really funny because they're very lightweight. And so then they'll climb to the very end of whatever uh, seed stock that they're eating off of. And the thing bends down and then they'll be kind of bopping around back and forth in the wind. So here you can see we have a whole area just dedicated to wildflowers, which then gets very dry looking. This would not be something that most people do, but we happen to have room in our backyard for it. And if I was in an urban wildland interface area, no way I could get away with this, uh, would be too much of a fire hazard. Uh, but in our yard, it's gorgeous color in the spring, but I'm not even showing you the spring picture. And it's great for pollinators in the spring uh, because wildflowers in the spring like that, that's easy beauty to see. But once you're tuning into the natural landscape, even here, this dried out, you know, the plants are dormant season. Here, the different tans and browns and the way that the different seed heads hold. And especially if you're, it's really hard to photograph, but if you're here in person during the early morning or late afternoon when the sun's at an angle and some of the fuzzier seed heads glow, and then seeing the birds go from the seeds to the bird bath and back, there's a beauty in there that once you're tuned into it, in some ways goes deeper than the, the glossy magazine of all the color and stuff like that. Uh, there's something very real here that's very, pleasurable to be in and around. And then over time, things are going to change. So as much as I love this and I'm still doing this, we actually did decide uh, in the last year to plant a few perennial plants that are going to have a little bit more uh, green and color throughout the year. Wildflowers in a large area are a lot of work because other weeds can come up in between the wildflowers and you have to try to weed those out and stuff. And so our just dedicated wildflower area is getting a little smaller, but we're introducing other very compatible, great habitat providing plants. And so a garden you know, can always change and evolve as you notice things, as you learn more, as you decide how much time you do want to spend in your garden versus other things. And so this is an example of that kind of naturalistic mulch layer over time that you might develop with those seeds and stems and so much more beneficial to the garden than any sort of just ground up wood chip or green waste mulch. Uh, you can't start with this. This is not something that you can buy. So that ground up wood chip mulch is, is great to get your garden off and started and help control the weeds at the beginning and help keep the soil temperatures down. But in a naturalistic garden, this, if you are going to have an organic layer, that's kind of the holy grail. So choosing and learning about native plants. Let's say we are going to take a quick five minute break. We always have a break during our workshops, let people use the restroom, uh, grab a drink of water, another cup of coffee, and then we will jump into uh, an example of choosing and learning about native plants, uh, two top online resources, and then we will keep going from there. So it's 11.01 now, we still have a lot to cover, so we'll jump back in at 11.06, and we'll see you soon.
Okay, welcome back. Let's start with a question that came in. Can you talk about fire and native plants? Can they be planted in zone one 30 feet near the house? What about selection right next to the open space native areas? What can be done not to contaminate in the native landscape? Uh, good question. I'm going to keep my answers very brief because that's only going to apply to maybe a couple of people. But in terms of that zone one, 30 feet near the house, best to check with your local fire district because different areas will have different recommendations, uh, and and it depends on the severity. Some people say you know no plant life within uh, that zone. Usually, it's more like. Uh, five feet. And then beyond that, it's going to be probably things that uh, can take irrigation year round and are not going to want summer dormancy. So there are some native evergreens and native grasses, kind of more meadow ecology stuff that can take year round irrigation. Uh, and so you can have that near the house, some of the perennials as well. And then in terms of not contaminating the native landscape, best to get in touch with a local uh, conservancy, especially sometimes there's going to be local conservancies or conservation districts that have nurseries that can provide native plants that were actually taken from the local genetics. So it, it is true, you know, if, uh, if white sage grows right outside of your backyard, you don't necessarily want to take a white sage from a random nursery, and you don't know if that white sage came from Northern California, if you're in Southern California, uh, and things that can cross. And so talk to the local people, especially uh, conservancies, conservation districts involved in restoration, if you're right in that interface area, and see if you can work with them or if they have resources to, to doing right by your local area. Uh, it, it all comes down to local knowledge in those areas, and you can still apply these general principles. Uh, do you, from Mike, do you recommend home gardeners transplanting plants from other areas? So if I understand the question right, transplanting means digging a plant out of the ground and planting it. Uh, in a different place. And so if from other areas, you mean digging them up in the wild and putting them in the ground, if the, if that wild is outside of your actual property that you own, uh, no, do not do that. Uh, people are, are not able to do that in most cases. I will say that most native plants, with some exceptions of like riparian, if you do have a large rural property, most native plants, uh, Mature plants are going to be very difficult to, to move. They have part of why they're, they're adapted is they have extensive root systems and they don't take well to uh, being ripped up. So oftentimes it's better to work with seed or cuttings. Uh, but even then, uh, you can't just go taking seed and cuttings from wild areas. So in most cases, for most gardeners, especially if you're in an urban or suburban area, uh, getting plants from a good local native a nursery that sells native plants is going to be the best way to go. Uh, okay, so let's keep going. And uh, quick, quick answer, just because it's a really easy one from Maricela. Can you recommend what's best to plant in San Gabriel Valley for monarch butterfly food? And this is for most of Southern California, uh, narrow leaf milkweed is the one which we showed earlier, but didn't show it in this beautiful state. So you can learn all about that in either of these resources. So choosing and learning about native plants, I'm going to show you uh, two top online resources that you can use for your plant selection. Let's go to... So the first one I'm going to show you is the Waterwise Garden Planner. And this is uh, my agency's website that we have just for people 
created for Southern California, Waterwise Garden Planner for Southern California. And we, we initially created it for uh, the inland valley areas, kind of you know, Riverside and the east area through our service area you know, out through San Fernando Valley. That's really kind of the sweet spot of exactly what this was created for. However, uh, people through kind of Los Angeles, Orange County, most of San Diego, uh, all going to be very similar. You can water on the lower end of the range if you get into like looking at watering situations. And then farther out through California, up through the Bay Area, uh, a lot of these plants are going to work very well. Uh, you'll just want to, again, check it with local knowledge, uh, local native plant chapters, uh, other resources, as well as, you know, double checking that things are going to work well for you. If you're out more in the true desert or getting into higher elevation, again, some of these plants are going to be great. Some of these plants will be native to your local area or are very well adapted, uh, but some of them might not deal as well with that high, high heat or, or the low winter temperatures if you're at higher elevation. So if the plant grows well in your area, uh, you'll be able to use the information but you want to check that with local uh, resources. But for most of Southern California, uh, this was created for you. This was created for people who aren't necessarily hobbyist gardeners, although for those who are, there's lots of good information. But we tried to make it as unintimidating as possible to kind of get going, choose the right plants for your space, and be successful. And we are continually working on new projects and finding new ways of explaining it in a less intimidating way because it can be seen that there's a lot to learn. And so the core of this are a couple of different things. The first one is the plant finder. And that is a searchable database where you can either search by plant by name or select different criteria. There are highlights of uh, or detailed information on a little over 300 uh, plants that are kind of commonly grown or we think should be commonly grown in Southern California. And right now 114 of those are California native. Gonna be adding a few more onto the list hopefully in the next couple of years. And so this is essentially our recommendations for most people, again, not necessarily specialty gardeners, uh, but you know, most people, they're interested in native plants. And, and what we kind of have on this list are things that someone is, someone is going to be likely to find, at least at the right time of year, at a good nursery that sells native plants, nothing too, too rare or too, too odd, and likely to be successful in growing. Uh, certain native plants, really kind of are more comfortable in the wild and they're just selected kind of perfect place that they evolved and can be tricky to grow in a garden. Some are very easy to grow in a garden. So we focused on the ones that are easier to grow in a garden. If you have access to local specialty nurseries like uh, in Southern California, California Botanic Gardens Nursery or Theodore Payne Foundation, they're going to have lots of awesome stuff that is not on this list because you're not going to be likely to find it most of the time throughout most of the year. That's not to say that that might not be an awesome plant for your garden. This is just a database for people getting started and then learn about other plants. And we'll look at another database, Calscape, in a moment that really goes into the wide, wide variety of native plants. Uh, but this is kind of the website for people, especially starting to learn about this stuff. And so you can select, you know, say you need a California native plant, you want it to be a shrub, your area is full sun. Well, now you're down to 58 and you can kind of look at pictures, get the most important right plant, right place information, uh, what kind of sun it needs, the height, the width, general water needs. And then there's much more information if you go to the more information. But then from there, say you also want it to be a good plant for butterflies. And now you maybe don't have that perfectly draining soil. So you can do plants for clay soil. Well, now you're down to our top 11 and can look at sizes, colors, or get the additional information. Oops, I'm not missing the image. Have to see what's going on with that. So, you know, from there, then you can go to more information and you can get pictures. 
uh, close, far, in gardens, individual, you get a description, additional plant properties for that right plant, right place, water needs, so you can see kind of the range of irrigation and how to group them. And so there's different quote irrigation schedules here. There's uh, like low water has a one and a two. And that doesn't mean that those plants aren't compatible. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, you know, the, the lower end of, of this is compatible with the, the lower irrigation schedule one, but this also shows that it can take a little bit more water as well. If it's going to be maybe an edge of an area that gets a little more water or grouped with some other plants, maybe you have a medium water use tree that you're gonna need to water twice a month. This can also group into getting a little bit more water from there. So don't be intimidated by the graph. There's uh, some links that kind of explain it more. And in terms of well, here we have inches of irrigation, doesn't tell you how many minutes because every irrigation system is different, but you can follow this and, and learn about how to understand what that means for your irrigation system. And then for all of these, you also are gonna to wanna to know how to maintain or how to care for these plants. And most of them are pretty easy to care for. They, they don't need to be touched more than once or twice a year, some of them not at all, but most gardens people will do a little bit of care for their plants once or twice a year. Uh, but some of them you wanna trim them back in the spring, some of them in the fall, kind of what to do, how much to do and when is important. And so we have that for all of them. And I encourage people, you know, once you create your garden, make, make your own little maintenance list uh, or spreadsheet or whatever works best for you. So you can kind of anticipate things and, and know what to be doing and what. And so that's the plant finder. If you want to, you can create your own login so you can sign in and save different lists for the front yard, for the backyard, for your grandma's house, any of that sort of stuff. We've also then over the years had a lot of requests from people who kind of say, yeah, that's nice, but I really just wanna know where to start. What are some nice groups of plants and how do I design them. And so we created these eight kind of templates where people can see how to use some of these plants already kind of coordinated around the different themes. So for example, uh, for people in this class, we have a butterfly and songbird garden and a pollinator garden template. There's also other native ones, uh, woodland garden, meadow garden, and these are all, you know, you can kind of mix and match. And so your whole yard doesn't need to be anything. So for example, the butterfly and songbird garden and the pollinator garden, in reality, both of them are going to be pretty good for all three of those. But we wanted to create some kind of different identities and, and things that people could take a look at. So you can use something like this as a base and then do your other research, pull other things in, really make it your own. But for example, for the butterfly and songbird garden, there's a coordinated set of plants and we keep, we're keep we keeping it simple. So for somebody just getting started, a couple of, these are large shrubs that can be pruned as trees. So a couple of tree options, three, uh, some shrubs that also will work for you in, you know, some need full sun, some can take some part shade or significant shade for the different spaces you're gonna have in your yard more structural evergreen shrubs, some that are more kind of flowery, but might be a little bit more dormant at time of the year. And then smaller perennial plants for kind of edges and highlights as well as an ornamental grass. So I think this is like 13 total different plants. You know, within that uh, first time gardener can learn about all of them, don't need to be intimidated. And then we have visualizations of what those plant combinations would look like in both extra large, large, medium, and small yards. And we set them up for front yards because we find these days that more people are thinking about redesigning their front yards than backyards as of now, but all of these concepts can work for backyards. And then different ways to visualize it from just the plants to with labels, to versions with pop-ups where then you could click on them and, and go to a new window with the plant profiles right away. And then if you like any of the looks of these, then you also get scaled exactly the same. Uh, we did this using a computer drafting program. So that visualization is this exact bird's eye view garden plan from a kind of perspective from the ground. And these can literally be printed out on 11 by 17 sheets of paper and every eighth of an inch would equal about a foot in the real world. And so you can look at how we would recommend spacings and plant combinations. 
And so for these extra large ones, we have these patio spaces as well, which, you know, maybe you have a medium yard where we didn't do the patio space in the plan, but you want a little patio space. And so you can combine elements if you want from the different sizes of yards, or maybe you have a small yard. So you don't have room for a tree, but how would you get some of these elements and use some of these plants? And so for all of them, there is that. And then if you want to, you can also download a PDF packet, which has the printable pages of all of those for the different garden themes, as well as many other details about like how to build dry stream beds and what are the easiest wildflowers to work with and lots more on the PDF packet for those detailed pages. And then from there, there's also some additional helpful lists. Like if you want to know, you know, what are some choices for hedges and screens or slopes to, to retain. And then finally, additional resources. So a quick way to get to our YouTube playlist of all our past workshop recordings, see our upcoming live workshops, a quick link to the online versions of those detailed pages I mentioned. So wildflowers, planting, different mulch options. For those of you in our local area, top places to get different kinds of plants, as well as irrigation materials, soils, rock, things like that. And how to get to our demonstration garden as well. So that is the Waterwise Garden Planner. The other one I wanna show you, if you're wanting to go deeper into native plants or plant butterfly interactions, uh, or really get access to the most extensive searchable database for native plants and how to grow them uh, that is around, you want to check out Calscape as well, which is a project of the California Native Plant Society and is an amazing resource. I use this all the time. You can search for your native plants by name, or you can do lots of other things. A really cool thing to do is just enter a zip code. Seven six three. That's the zip code here at the Waterwise Community Center, and you'll get back what their records. And this is based on uh, observations of where native plants are, and then additional uh, like mileage radiuses put on them to help count for areas that have been urbanized for a long time. And so, in their database, they have six hundred sixty-two plants that were thought to at one point have been native to this area. And of them, then you can see, you know, what trees, shrubs, et cetera. When you get this back, that doesn't mean that there's gonna be 662 plants that are all necessarily going to be easy to grow in a garden or that you might be able to actually find at a nursery to grow. And so from there, you can look at example, like what are the very easy plants to grow if you are a uh, new gardener? Or what you can also do is an advanced search where if you want to know what's locally native, you can do that. Now, I'll also say you don't only need to plant plants that are locally native to your area. So for example, uh, in my garden, I have some native plants that are hybrids and some native plants that come more from the desert because they really extend that uh, summer bloom season. Or for example, maybe you have a really, really hot, hot, hot reflected heat situation where in the summer it's hotter than it ever would have been here uh, historically because there's an asphalt driveway and a block wall and et cetera. Maybe you'll want a desert plant there. And so you can decide, and if you're doing your research, you can try with your zip code, try without, but then you can also do all those right plant, right place factors, your sun, your soil drainage. If you have well-drained soil, you might be able to skip it, but if you have slow drainage, definitely want to put that in. Uh, ease of care. And then also what I'd like to do oftentimes planting a garden is to put commonly available in a nursery. Because if you're going for plants that are rarely available, you might not be able to find them. Sometimes when you go to the nursery, you might see a plant that's rarely available and decide you want to grab it and find a spot for it in your garden. But sometimes it's hard to plan unless you're going to be willing to wait two, three, four years to put something in that space for plants that are rarely available. And then from there, they will have plant profiles as well. They also have something cool called their Calscape Garden Planner, where you can tell it some questions. So say Montclair for our city.
what do you want? The HOA friendly. That was some, something that someone asked about earlier. Say we're in full sun. And we're interested in pollinator habitat, bird watching, and water conservation, but we don't have deer. And so that's just another way of getting into their database and coming up with these are going to be plants that are tend to be uh, available in nurseries and are going to work well for those situations. And then you can get their details on it. So that is Calscape, awesome resource as well. So with that, so plenty more to cover. So let's jump back into the workshop. Uh, someone asked if I'll post the links to these websites. I'll type them into the chat right now. Thank you for asking. So the first one was, and I actually forgot to update this logo. We rebranded from Inland Valley Garden Planner to Waterwise Garden Planner recently. And it's the first time I've taught this workshop since then. So the first one is waterwisegardenplanner.org. And the second one is calscape.org. That one is a project of the California Native Plant Society. And then also really cool if you're interested in habitat gardening, especially learning about butterflies and the different plants that are going to be the larval host plants for butterflies, as well as the nectar plants for the adult butterflies. So oftentimes butterflies will only have a few specific plants that their caterpillars can be raised on, like a lot of people know about monarchs and milkweeds. Uh, but for other kinds of butterflies, like different species of swallowtail butterflies, there's going to be different plants that are going to be the ones that their larva need to feed on to grow up on. And so uh, Calscape has some great information on that, but the Landscape Integrity Films and Education is a YouTube channel that has great native plant content, and they have a series of videos that really goes deeply into those relationships and what plants you can have in your garden to support both the mature as well as larval butterflies and all sorts of other really beautifully shot content. So that's Landscape Integrity Films and Education YouTube channel. And so we are currently at 1130. I think I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly because this section, because it's something that if you really want to be able to use it, you're going to have to uh, kind of download the pictures or download the slides anyways from the cbwcd.org slash presentations, which I listed at the top of the chat. And so this these are... Uh, excerpts from the Inland Valley Garden Planner that I showed you, but just to kind of show you how those will highlight different great combinations of plants. So this is from the bird and butterfly extra large garden. So even if you don't have an extra large garden, here are just some little vignettes of some of my favorite plant combinations. So here, in this case, this is along the walkway to the front yard. Uh, Trees and shrubs, or maybe some large bunch grasses, are going to be the, the vast majority of what you want to put in your yard. But along walkways, sometimes our native shrubs can get quite large. You don't know exactly how large, for example, most buckwheats or sages are going to get down to the foot. It just depends on kind of situations, uh, conditions. And so along like a main walkway to the front, I'm not going to put a big native sage plant right here because it's just either too likely it'll grow over the edge which is most cases or if i put it way back to make sure it won't then i might have too much open space and so right along walkways are great places to put some of those smaller perennial plants or if you're just starting with one planter that's in full sun or partial shade uh here are some kind of top plants for that margarita bach penstemon it's great for hummingbirds and bees Hosts for butterflies and moths. Here I put, you know, what butterflies, but again, I'm going to just kind of gloss over this because you're not going to necessarily memorize this for me just saying it once, but this is here as a reference, kind of seeing the general ideas of near the pathway, you're going to be working with normally kind of smaller perennial plants, maybe mixing in some wildflowers. Red buckwheat is another top one that you've seen in some of the pictures already, uh, both for birds as well as for butterflies, both larvae caterpillars and adult butterflies for the nectar. And then moving on here, this is a, 
large perennial to small shrub, Delamina verbena, one of the best nectar plants in spring through early summer for adult butterflies, also used by bees. Can go semi-dormant in the summer. So if you don't want anything dried up at all, maybe this one would be one for farther back in the landscape. Uh, if it's kind of in a little bit more shade or you know partial shade, it, it stays looking pretty good. So I have one on the north side of my house, uh, maybe five feet away from the north side of my house that's still looking great. The one in full blasting sun in my backyard is pretty dormant right now. And then hummingbird sage is another real kind of all-star plant uh, used by hummingbirds as well as pollinators. Smells amazing, often flowers again in the fall. This one, if it's not in partial shade, is gonna need a little bit of extra irrigation to prevent it from going dormant. And it just depends. So like a couple of years ago, before we are in as much of a drought, my front yard, I water once a month. And in between, I'd get out there with a hose and just kind of give this some hand water so it doesn't go dormant at full sun. This year, uh, I'm letting it go much, much more dormant. It's kind of died back some, trimmed it back some, but as soon as it cools off, it will be back and looking good again. So you can kind of decide, you know, HOA, first native landscape to go in. Maybe you're gonna be doing that little extra watering or choosing things that are just not gonna go dormant. Uh, real naturalistic, not concerned about that. You just let things go dormant if you want. So here's an example of favorites for north facing or shady planter areas. Those areas can be a little bit tricky in a hot dry area like Southern California. The direct north side of a building because the sun is not completely, completely overhead much of the year, especially in winter, the sun at noon is still pretty low in the south side of the sky. North side of the building is gonna be shaded a good part of the year. But then by the time we get to high midsummer, the sun is full blasting overhead during the day. And so on the north facing part of a house or a garage, you're gonna to wanna to select plants that can take either partial shade or full sun. It's not as many plants that are adapted to both conditions, but we have some great ones and plenty of good ones to have a, a wonderful garden on the north side of the house. I mentioned coffee berry earlier. Uh, that's one of my absolute go-tos. And in hot inland Southern California, there are a number of kind of dwarf or smaller cultivars of coffee berries. Uh, with different names associated with them. Some of those are actually better on the coast. For me, uh, if they're not in partial shade or if they have that full blasting sun any part of the year, there's a dwarf coffee berry called Eve Case, which uh, has done the best for me out of any of those dwarf ones. And that's just absolutely, absolutely incredible for that Northern exposure. You can do a whole line of them as a great foundation planting. Uh, manzanitas are excellent. Sunset manzanita is one that's very easy to grow, very beautiful. Can be a shrub or over time a small tree, but you can prune it to keep it smaller. And then lots of perennials from hummingbird sage, California strawberry, yarrow is a really good one as well. Another kind of easy point of entry for starting to work with habitat plants, both for the plants as well as for the structure, is putting in a habitat hedge. And this can be very simple, but a lot of people, even if they're not ready to redo a whole yard, have an area that's going to be along a property boundary, maybe along a fence, maybe along a wall that's less than attractive. So many of our suburbs, including the house I grew up in, have a... Uh, less than attractive cinder block wall around the whole thing. And so one of the ways to have your yard look a lot nicer is to not see that by having plant material in front of it. And so a habitat hedge is basically just choosing, could be one, but even better to choose two, three, four different shrub species that are going to get some height to them, you know, six, eight feet, maybe up to 10, 12 feet tall could be a combination depending on if you're going for a more formal look or a more wild mix look is good. With that habitat hedge, you're often going to plant them a little bit closer together, just like if you're planting a traditional hedge. Uh, you know, maybe over time, these plants could get eight feet wide, but we're gonna plant them a little closer, maybe five feet apart. So it grows in to have that nice density. And then these are all going to be species that can take a little pruning in the front or in the back. Uh, I have three favorite go-tos for habitat hedges. The habitat hedge in my front yard, I mentioned earlier, it's California coffee berry and holly leaf cherry. 
if you have room for a third one, a coyote brush is excellent. That's going to have a little bit more of a quote, native kind of wilder look kind of does its own thing, although it can take pruning very, very well, where the holly leaf cherry and the California coffee berry are incredible, incredible habitat plants, both for butterflies as well as birds and pollinators, uh, but have a kind of stately evergreen look uh, pretty much year round or year round. And then another kind of nice thing to do, simple landscape is a kind of a grassiness, especially along the edge of a landscape where you want uh, to create a, a sense of depth, but you're not really have a space for like large overhead shrubs. And you want it to be, you know, not something you're walking through all the time, but maybe easy to walk through. Uh, I like really doing kind of some dryish meadows uh, using deer grass as a large bunch grass. And then with some shrubs as well as perennials intermixed. I really love for that showy penstemon, which is a local native to Southern California. It still grows in a never developed uh, vacant spot of land up the street in Claremont from where we are at the Waterwise Community Center. And that's just a absolute powerhouse plant for pollinators and butterflies, which can kind of grow seasonally when its flowers are very tall up in between the grasses. Looks very, very beautiful. And then other shrubs that I like to mix in, Allen Chickering Sage or Desert Mallow. And so again, with the garden planner, this is that extra large version. And so maybe if you have a smaller yard, you might only take one of those vignettes or one idea from one of those vignettes, but useful to look at that. And then a similar level of thought was put in from everything to the medium to large to, you know, if you have a small yard, uh, then, you might not have room for a tree, but carefully selecting a few larger shrubs and then maybe having a meadowy area that's very simple with just, just the yarrow and a few perennials around the side. So uh, other examples, or this may be if you have, you might have a large backyard, but you just have like one area that's kind of distinct and small. Maybe you'll use the small front yard example. So you can check all of that out. And if you kind of get into it and look at the plants and all of that, you will see that you know, I just chose to, to go deeper into a few vignettes, uh, but there's that similar level of thought placed all throughout all of those examples. And you can do this in containers too. Uh, you know, if you're just getting started or you know, for a long time, uh, I rented and I had to do most of my gardening in containers. And so, you know, that's the case for lots and lots of people you can still do it. It will take a bit more care and a bit more frequent watering, but you can grow many of our favorite habitat plants in containers. Some will take full blasting sun all day, but if you're growing in containers, uh, because of the hot heat in inland Southern California, if you have space, even for the full sun plants, to put them somewhere where they get some afternoon shade in the hot time of the year, that's going to really help them be looking good and blooming longer throughout more of the year in many cases. And basically, if you're growing in containers, uh, none of the watering frequencies that you would look at on the normal resources like the Inland Valley Garden Planet or Calscape are going to apply. There's just so much less soil for the roots to grow in, even in a big pot that, and there's, with it being raised, depending on the pot material and the amount of sun hitting it, tends to dry out faster. So basically, you're just going to check using your built-in mo moisture sensor, which is your finger. And when the top one to two inches of soil are pretty dry, then you're gonna water again. Uh, usually for quite large size pots, this will be about once a week in warm weather, but it could be more. Uh, this year, it's just been, we haven't had that many like above 100 degree days, but it's been over 90 consistently for, I don't even know how long. And so I do find that some of the native patio plants that I have that are in full sun, I am watering more than once a week, even in larger containers. And, you know, if you have, if they're in terracotta pots, those breathe, they're going to dry out faster. If they're in plastic pots, they're going to dry out a little bit more slowly. So it, it's all about just checking on it and starting to like learn the pace of what's going to work for your situation. You might have an area and the smaller containers might need to be watered every couple of days. And the Larger ones, maybe less often. So you can go from there. Uh, for the potting soil that you use, uh, you can't go wrong with just using uh, cactus mix 
potting soil because that drains really well, which is what most of the native plants want. Uh, some of the native plant nurseries uh, will sell their own special blend as well. Like I think Theodore Payne Foundation will sell its own kind of custom blend of what they really like for their, uh, their plants and they use in their nursery as well. So uh, just a reference slide for those of you who are interested, you can either take a screenshot or download the presentation again. But a lot of our top habitat plants, especially for the smaller perennials, uh, do just as well in containers. And uh, th this is just some of my favorites. There are many, many more plants that will grow very well in containers. So what about finding them, buying them, planting them, and all of that? Well, there are a lot of resources. Again, on our YouTube channel, we have whole other workshops about that. So the best thing if you're just getting started is to use this in tandem with those other more general how to install and care for a garden videos. So for that, definitely check out our choosing, purchasing, and planting waterwise and native plants online workshop or you can join us in the winter when we'll teach that in person here, uh, because it's important once you go to the nursery to get your plants, even if you know what you want, that you select healthy plants that are the right size, they're not overgrown. Uh, the biggest plant in the pot is not necessarily the best deal, it might be root bound and overgrown. So we will walk you through all of that, choosing, purchasing, and properly planting them. I highly encourage you to watch, especially if you're going to be redoing your whole front yard or your whole backyard or a whole community garden or school garden, the installation and establishment of California Native and Waterwise Gardens Online Workshop. If you are very interested and you're even just doing one planter bed, maybe it'll be worth it. But if you're like, yeah, I know how to plant plants. I'm just going to, I need three plants and I just want to make sure that they're good habitat plants. You don't necessarily need that. But if you're doing a whole yard, even just getting a couple of new tips can really pay off in terms of uh, your efficiency in installing things and keeping things happy, especially through that first year of establishment. And then we have all that plant maintenance information at Inland Valley Garden Planner. And so if you really are getting into some of the more rare native plants, then, for example, we only have profiles of a few of the easiest to grow manzanitas. But the care for the manzanitas are going to be the same no matter what species of manzanita it is pretty much. And so you can use some of the similar uh, information. And then when you look at that information, some of it's going to say, you know, pinch back or cut back part way, or normally we try to be very clear, cut back by a third, cut back by half. Uh, we have tried to make the maintenance information as clear as possible with written directions. But we also have a recording of pruning and maintenance for home gardens and landscapes online workshop. And so that, if you watch it, will really help you, uh, give you kind of visual examples of what some of those written instructions on the Inland Valley Garden Planner uh, are referring to, where in that workshop we show you kind of, here's the plant, here's it after it's pruned, maybe here's it halfway through pruning. And definitely we are, teaching more and more seasonal garden care workshops here at the Waterwise Community Center, which are just all hands-on, no slideshow. You join us and normally George, who is our lead gardener here, who takes care of our demonstration garden, is going to be leading those and will walk around, for example, in the fall and walk you through important fall maintenance tasks and kind of show you that pruning here and in person. So if you're in Southern California and want to travel out to our Waterwise Community Center facility in Montclair, you can join us for those in-person, kind of ask your questions and really see how it's done in real time. And then I already showed you our local landscape suppliers list, which you can find now online at the Waterwise Garden Planner. And so as we get towards the end of the workshop. Here's some additional resources. Now, again, there's no point in me just reading through every bit of this text to you, but they're here in case you want to download. And again, I'll put the download link in for if you want to download all of these slides. And that's cbwcd.org slash presentations. So if you go there, for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, you can just find on that list, it's going to be gardening for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and more. Right-click, 
and select download linked file as however you want to do it. And then you'll get access to a big PDF file where each of these slides is one page. Uh, worst case scenario, if you click on it, it'll just take a few minutes to put the whole PDF up in your web browser, and then you can do save as. Uh, Mike just asked, is this on YouTube as well? Yes. So currently, if you go to our main workshop playlist, cbwcd.org slash YouTube, which is the easiest, there is a already edited down, so there's not like the time during the break and the downtime at the beginning uh, version of when I taught this in the past. But this is also being recorded live, and so it's not going to be edited in the same way right away. It won't be in that main workshop playlist. But if you follow that cbwcd.org slash YouTube link, like as immediately as soon as, as this uh workshop is done, and then you click back out to get to our main YouTube page profile for the WaterWise Community Center, there will be like a most recent uploads. I, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but the most recent uploads, and you'll see the raw unedited, unedited version of this class that we just had that will be available for you to review right away because it's being co-live streamed to YouTube right now, and it just makes that available automatically. And so 20 common backyard birds in Southern California. There's going to be more of them, but if you start doing this, these are going to be the 20 most common that, that uh, in my experience, that you will see. And then for each of these profiles, what the bird eats, where you'll likely see it, and kind of some uh, quick ID sort of tips. And so again, you can perfectly be a great habitat gardener, without needing to learn all the names of all of the birds. But a lot of people find that that it's fun to learn their names. And then definitely what I find is that, you know, I really started getting into birds after my partner did, and she joined the local chapter of the Audubon Society and started getting better with, with bird identification. Uh, but for years, I had done this sort of gardening, but never really learned all the names of the birds. But when we started learning the names of the birds, that's also when we noticed the patterns, because mentally the way humans work is that when you have a, a label for something, you can retain noticing it and the patterns. And so it was only after I learned the name of, names of the birds that I really started noticing, for example, that the goldfinches and the house finches were, were around year round, whereas the oriole, that's pretty noticeable. So we notice when that comes and goes, uh, but the oriole, who now that we've built more habitat seems to come around more regularly on an annual basis is only going to be around for a few weeks sometimes. Uh, the white crowned sparrow spends its summers up in the higher elevations of the San Gabriel Mountains, but will winter as a permanent resident in our yard. And I mean, literally, they showed up in our yard the first day of fall last year. And so learning the names, uh, having that mental category of white crowned sparrow versus house finch. Uh, to, turned us into those those patterns more, tuned us into those patterns more, and has really just been a, a deeper level of enjoyment that I have found for my garden. Uh, but if that seems like homework to you, then don't worry about it. Uh, certain things remain very difficult. So especially some of these birds fly super quick. You will learn more over time. So never beat up on yourself because you know I, I can't tell the difference between them. For me, I still struggle, especially when they're flying around in the garden, telling the difference between Anna's hummingbird and Alan's hummingbird. Uh, and you know, one for the males has more of the pink color, one is more of an orange color. But when they're flying through the yard, it's super hard to tell. Uh, perfectly fine to be like, I have hummingbirds, and I appreciate that, and and I'm still kind of there. Uh, so here's that hummingbird nest that I mentioned. You can see the strands of spider webs that are kind of holding this together with the elastic. Speaking of hummingbirds, if you are interested in hummingbird feeders, this is my favorite hummingbird feeder design. Uh, it's easy to find. And the reason why is because if you're going to feed hummingbirds, it is super important to keep that hummingbird uh, nectar that you make clean. And, and you don't buy stuff from the store, the red colored stuff that you, you don't want to do that. It's just, it's just the right ratio. And you could look it up online of boiling sugar with water, letting it cool. Uh, but because it's sugar and water, especially in the warm season, it will mold super quick and not be good for the birds. So it needs to be kept clean on a very regular basis. 
If you're not the kind of, and changed like every couple of days in the warm weather, if you're not the kind of person to do this, just let the plants be the feeders. That's perfectly good. I would not be able to keep up with this. I wouldn't do a good job, just how I am. My partner, Kira, does. And so this is one of her projects and they use it and it's great. And it's perfectly healthy for them. The nectar is really just kind of sugar water. I talked to an ornithologist about this once because I was always on the fence about whether or not I thought it was okay. Uh, if it's made correctly, that's just fine, but you need to keep it clean. Uh, so bush tits, sometimes you'll learn, you know, bush tits, you'll, you'll hear more than you'll often see in the garden and so on and so on. Uh, and so that's, and like hawks, for example, when there's a hawk that goes through my yard quickly, I'm not going to know if it's a red shouldered hawk or a red tail hawk, but you learn more over time. And maybe one day I will just like at one point in time, I didn't know the difference between the different finches. Uh, what about birdhouses? So certain birdhouses can be useful depending on where you are, but you want to make sure that they are made correctly. So for example, bluebird houses are a common one because bluebirds tend to nest in hollows of dead trees. We don't leave those dead trees in our suburbs. And so a properly built bluebird box will provide for that. But that means a specific size hole so that the bluebirds can get in, but the predators cannot. Uh, waterproof, something that can be opened up and cleaned very well between seasons. And these are easy to find online, but you want to do a little bit of research. Don't just buy something cheap from a gift store with a hole in it. That's not necessarily going to actually support the needs of a bird well. And there's DIY plans for these as well. So if you want to get into it, you're going to do a little bit of research and make sure that you're doing the right thing. Also, where you put them in the tree is important. Some birds, you know, it's best to have it north facing, uh, far enough out on a branch that a raccoon or a squirrel can't easily crawl to it to get it. Some of them are mounted on hooks or posts. And so you can get into that if you want to. And then even then, you're, you're most cases going to be a little bit hit and miss as to who moves in and when. You may or may not get your target species. So you can do this, but this is really only a supplemental thing after, remember, providing for that structural cover places to raise young with, with some trees and shrubs, hopefully. And then this can kind of augment from there if you're interested. Native bees are tricky to identify. Uh, I am just starting to learn the identification for native bees. But for me, you know, the habitat principles in the garden gets the native bees there. I enjoy seeing them. And I am just barely starting to learn uh, the different identification. So get into it as much as you want to, or you can just uh, you know have a general appreciation. But if you want the reference, here are some general category references. We talked about you can have plans or make your own for these kind of bee hotels. And in some ways that's kind of cool because you can see if they've you know, used them or not, but these don't last forever. And sanitation becomes a thing again, because if they're kind of concentrating so many in one place, uh, so this is the natural version or a slightly nicer put together version of that. And remember that bare soil is essential for bees. Lizards. Most lizards in Southern California, the most common one is going to be the Western fence lizard, and that can have a whole variety of different looks. The, the females tend to be darker, the males might be more colorful, and especially uh, seasonally have these bright, the really fit males that have been eating well, really bright blue kind of chin areas, and will be doing push-ups to show off. Females do the push-ups sometimes too. Uh, you might get larger uh, alligator lizards, which are really cool looking. Sometimes when you see them quickly, you think there's a snake in my garden. Uh, alligator lizards. And then you may or may not also see side blotched lizards. Uh, I have so many fe Western fence lizards in my yard. They're hilarious. And they eat ants and some other things and are cool to have around. For the reference for the butterflies for Southern California, uh, also provided the main host plants that the larvae need to live off of. And so ultimately, though, if you have a wide variety of native plants hitting all of the popular common native plants, uh, sages, penstemons, 
buckwheats, and then getting into the shrubs, coffee berry, cherry, uh, ceanothus, if you have room to really have a bunch of different shrubs, you'll, you'll be attracting a lot. And then I also provided some of the butterflies in here, which are actually not native butterflies, but are now established in our neighborhoods because their larval host plants are here. So for example, Western giant swallowtail, main host plant is citrus. And so if you have citrus in your neighborhood, uh, you might have these. Their caterpillars have evolved to look like bird poops, which is kind of hilarious. Uh, cabbage white. And so even if they're non-native butterflies, they're still going to be really important bird food as well. Oaks, if you have room for an oak, uh, plant one. Even if you don't have room for a big oak tree, there are scrub oaks, which are shrubbier oaks, which will still be incredible important, incredibly important plants for butterflies in your garden. I could have gone on for oaks for 20 minutes, half an hour, but there's so much other stuff to cover. So the, the end thing is just if you have room for a big tree, plant a big oak. If you don't have room for a big tree, try to find room to plant a scrub oak. They are considered a uh, ecological hub species. Uh, so important. There's only a few plants that are considered ecological hub species because of all the interactions that uh, different wildlife have with the tree, and then all the secondary and tertiary interactions that happen. If you have room for an oak, plant one. Buckwheats are really good for uh, these little butterflies called blues, which are just so beautiful, and hair streaks as well. And so, then, so the last thing is, this is not a talk, this was about the principles where we go kind of one by one by one through all of the cool plants, because hopefully I've shown that you can do that research on your own as you figure out what's best for you. But for those of you who want to download the PDF, here is the reference for, if you're just getting started with this, here are my favorite habitat plants for gardens in Southern California. And many of these grow well throughout much of the rest of California. And so just kind of going through a little bit about oaks, a little bit about milkweed, a little bit about annual wildflowers, and just some kind of advice. And then we go through category by category, patio trees, larger trees, small, et cetera, et cetera, through all the different categories. If you do want a more kind of narrated version of uh, the top plants and what I like about them, including both kind of more not habitat related garden aspects of it, uh, some visual aspects, as well as some of the habitat related stuff, there is a whole other workshop for that, which is favorite plants for Southern California gardens, which is on our YouTube. And I teach once or twice a year uh, as well. And that really is kind of going through similar categories than this and me narrating a lot of the same information and throwing in other tidbits about what I love about them. So you can check that out on the YouTube page. And with that, that brings us to 12 o'clock. So what I am going to do, some of you might need to uh, hop off right now with the 12 o'clock and time. Well, thank you for joining us. If you have just a second, I am going to launch a quick closing poll just for questions. And then I'm going to get into answering all of the remaining questions that have come in, as well as any other that people have. Uh, but please let me know what you thought about the class in the closing poll. Uh, we are always trying to improve how we teach all of our different topics. There's always so much to share. And so we want to make sure people are getting what they are interested in out of the workshop. In addition to the poll, there's only so much that those numbers actually really show. So if you learned anything that you feel was particularly helpful, it's always great to hear about that. And if there's anything that you didn't learn that you're hoping to learn or that didn't work for you, I always look at all the chat. So please let me know in the chat. Uh, I like that more critical feedback just as much as the positive feedback. Right before I get into the, uh, the questions, I did want to put up this very last slide just to review. The class in essentially one slide. Plant a variety of native plants of different sizes that bloom throughout different times of the year. Can use 
Calscape, Waterwise Garden Planner, or whatever local database is going to be appropriate to where you live, as well as local knowledge, botanical gardens, native plant societies to find that. Don't cut off the seed heads too soon. And when you do, if you can, leave them in the garden. Provide a source of water. Don't be too clean. If you can, leave some branches, sticks, leaves, etc. And a mix of, if you have some wood chip mulch, that's fine, but mixing in some gravel, some stones, some bare soil, and then that natural mulch and old seeds that are going to develop over time. If you do all of those, you're going to have a great garden for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and other critters. And then as I get into answering the questions, I'll leave up. These are just a lot of the links that we mentioned throughout the workshop. So let's get into the questions. Uh, Gloria, Jay Berry, need an ant moat for hummingbird feeders. Yes. Yeah, so one of the cool things that I like about that design of hummingbird feeder that I showed is that there's a little thing that you can fill on the top. You fill it with water. And then that makes it a little bit more difficult for ants to get into the sugary part of it because they'd have to swim through it. Occasionally, a few of them do, but, but it works pretty well. You can also buy uh, a secondary ant moat. That's a little cup of water that goes in between the chain that it would hang from and the actual hummingbird feeder itself. Uh, remember, that's one of the important things about cleaning your hummingbird feeder as well, uh, that you also would dump that out, which will happen automatically when you clean your hummingbird feeder and refill it so that you don't start getting mosquitoes in there. Uh, from Mallory Perry, any good hedges three feet tall for next to the driveway? Uh, if, it, 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 if it is full sun, you might try, and it can be a little bit wider than three feet, you might try that Eve Case California coffee berry, and you're you're going to have to prune it a decent amount still, but it can take that pruning. I mean, I have seen even... Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because it'll take a lot of work. I have seen uh, lemonade berry, which is a big California native shrub, but it takes pruning really well. Kept that small. Cal uh, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden has a great example, but that's going to be a lot of work. If it is part shade, my go-to three-foot tall shrub, or if it's shade and it gets a little wider but it takes pruning, is uh, creeping Oregon grape, even though the common name is Oregon grape. It grows in California. That's what I have for like a about three foot tall foundation planting on the north facing side of my house. Uh, it has about three feet wide to grow. It would grow wider, but it's really easy to prune. So when it starts getting too close to my walkway, I prune it. And that's an absolutely incredible habitat plant. Uh, from Victoria, some of the plants were labeled as plant name plus CVS. What does CVS mean? Great question. CVS means cultivars. And so a cultivar is a horticultural selection of a species of plant that there was something particularly no notable about it. And so one was noticed somewhere. Sometimes it's in the garden. Sometimes it's in the wild. And then to get the exact plant that acts the exact same way. Uh, grows the exact same size for the most part, the shape, whatever's notable about it. It's then propagated instead of from seed, from cutting. So essentially every other one with that same name is a clone. So we'll, we'll keep talking about coffee berry because I've mentioned it recently a few times. So California coffee berry is a great plant. It's a shrub, normally eight to 12 feet tall and wide. It can take pruning, uh, amazing plant, but pretty large. So Eve Case is the name of a cultivar of California coffee berry that tends to be a dwarf. And so that one is going to be maybe six feet wide, normally four, maybe five feet tall with no pruning, but you can also still prune that one and keep it even smaller. It just doesn't grow as big or as vigorously, but it's a very nice plant. And so you'll see other cultivar names as well for plants that are they are part of the larger species, but they exhibit a specific characteristic. Uh, oftentimes, maybe it might be the flower is a little different, or maybe it is more dwarf thing or something like that. And there's a specific reason why the nurseries uh, propagate it and offer that exact one. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, from Mike. Should bamboo be avoided in landscaping and treated as a native plant? You know, it's always, it depends. Uh, running bamboos will take over a whole yard and are a lot of work to keep maintained. And in Southern California, take quite a bit of water to stay happy. 
Uh, so I would never design it into a garden in Southern California in this day and age, especially with our water restrictions. Uh, but in terms of invasive plant, normally invasive really means it's going to displace other plants in the wild. Uh, I'm not worried about it being an invasive plant that much in uh, unless it's like in a riparian area where I live because it's gonna die in the wild. It just doesn't have enough water. Uh, if you live in a much moister area, uh, maybe it would be an invasive plant, especially the running bamboos. Um, okay, let's see what else. Uh, Lore, please discuss feeding fertilizer needs for plants in containers. Uh, great question. Uh, you can a couple of times a year feed native plants in containers with uh, a, a light amount of any organic all-purpose fertilizer. I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. Certainly, like if you look at an or a, a box of fertilizer, for native plants, they're adapted to low fertility regimes. Uh, you don't need to fertilize them nearly at that rate. Uh, we have a bunch of native plants in containers at our place. We don't fertilize them. They seem to grow fine. Uh, and in fact, you don't want to over fertilize because then you're just going to push on a lot of growth and you can't let them get too big in the pot anyways, because native plants, uh, tend to be adapted to pretty lean soils. In Southern California, our soils have a lot of most nutrients, but tend to be nitrogen poor, which fuels just uh, plant tissue growth, you know, the general growth of, of stems and leaves and things like that. So our plants still know how to grow, but they've learned how to do that or evolved to do that in low fertility situations. And even when you get something like cactus mix that's relatively lean, it starts with a pretty high amount of soil fertility compared to where these native plants have come from. So certainly when you first plant them, if you're working with a commercial potting soil blend, even cactus mix, you're not gonna need to fertilize. Over time, because you're washing kind of through that soil every time you give your, your plants a deep water, certainly you'll strip out some nutrients. Uh, but kind of informally, if you toss in a couple of handfuls and scratch it in a little bit a couple of times a year, that's probably fine. Uh, you could probably get into it more and figure things out if you need to, but you don't need to be super obsessive about it with native plants. It's not like growing orchids or something like that. Uh, it's something that I've never gotten into just because it's not really ever been an issue. Normally, with even with native plants, uh, other than like a lot of people will grow dudleyas, which are really cool native succulents in pots, and they could be fine long term. But a lot of the other native plants, every couple of years, you might need to pull them out of the pot and do what's called repotting, which is you pull it out of the pot, you're going to shave down uh, maybe about a third of the roots and put it back in the pot. You probably need to put some potting soil on the bottom because it shrunk down a little bit and then repot the sides. And when you do that, you're putting in a little bit of, of new potting soil as well. So you know, I guess that's that's a little bit of a rant of you might want to fertilize over time, but you don't need to be real obsessive about it for native plants because they don't they just don't need that much. Uh, okay, it seems like that's all of the questions. Uh, I will hang out while people filter out in case there are any other last questions. Uh, but other than that, I hope you had a great time today. Thank you for spending a good chunk of your Saturday morning with me. Happy gardening. Uh, remember, we are in the hottest time of the year and even native plants uh, really aren't that excited about being planted right now and would require a lot of extra care to do that. So this is the perfect time to be teaching yourself, to be learning more, to be thinking about design. This is the perfect time of year to be killing your lawn if you have one. And we have a workshop all about in detail, removing your turf the right way, getting ready, and then planting in the fall, thinking you know right before Thanksgiving through New Year's as the sweet spot. So lots of time to uh, learn more, get excited, uh, do your research, and then be ready really for the sweet spot of the year. Thank you for joining us, everybody, and hope to 
meet you in person one day at the Waterwise Community Center and see you in future workshops. Have a good rest of your weekend.